It's a bright new morning. Yes, it's Wednesday, the 25th of October, 2017. Jumbo Africa. And a very good morning. I'm Elvis Preslin. I'm Kendall Makamate. Good morning to you. Now, we will be with you until 12. Now, remember, today we focus on crime. Now, the crime stats was released yesterday, which indicate that contact crimes such as murder and robbery have shown an upward trend, Kendall. I found very interesting at the same time as they were being released, we found out that the deputy police minister's nephew had just been stabbed, and that's why he wasn't at work. But I want to find out from you, are the crime stats a true reflection of your experience? Yes, of course. We would like to get your experience in the country. There's a uh, hundred and forty-nine percent in Kendall. Absolutely interesting. That sixty-five percent are saying no. They're not a true reflection of their experiences. Whereas thirty-five percent believe that yes, this is pretty much what they have in their lives. Yep. But you're also uh, sending us tweets on uh, this one. Gadani says, um, "Just take a look at KZN, and that should give you a good indication of crime stats and how that reflect the experience of so many people in the country." Uh, Walter White says uh, these stats only reflect on reported cases. There are millions, millions of incidents that go unreported. And that is so true. There's a number of people that says petty crime. They don't report it anymore because nothing happens. And sometimes that. something like uh, domestic violence does not get reported. Mm -hmm. You know, so yes, it does happen that uh, maybe that's exactly what's going on. People so are not saying. I would like to find out from you what you're telling us on the Twitter handle as well as on the Facebook page. But we're also asking you uh, a question this morning because we focus on the finance minister, Malusi Gaba. It's a big day for him. He will deliver his first, his maiden midterm budget policy statement, which we call the mini budget. Yeah, absolutely. It's happening this afternoon, later on today. But we want to find out from you, what do you want the Minister of Finance to address in the mini budget? Let's take a look at what you're telling us. Uh, this one from Tebo Hall says, put more money in higher education. <laughs> well, there you go. Fees must fall is on the table. Katlako says, I want to hear about SAA, ESCOM, and SABC's bailouts. Remove unnecessary expenditure, especially VIP and luxury treatment for ministers. Corruption is the enemy of growth. Well, there you have it. Keep them coming, but we also focus on sport. Hey, it looks like Eric Tinkler is on fire. Does he have the magic touch or the, the mojo that everybody is talking about? Well, that's exactly what we're asking you that, you know, mm -hmm. because we want to find out from you because it's been some time since this man has actually been in several different finals as assistant coach, as coach, and again as coach of Super Sports United. We want to find out from you, has Eric Tinkler found that magic formula we need uh, to succeed on the continent? Sikamo says, uh, I hope so. His troops will be tested uh, will, uh, with a lot of matches to come. I hope that Supersport FC will win the cup. Michael Bigham Stoller says, not really, up until he brings the, okay, the CAF Confederation Cup home. But he inherited a very good squad from Stuart Baxter that can go all the way and all the best. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. He has inherited a good squad, but he's managed it well too. The credit where it's due definitely needs to be given. Well, there you have it. Let's get down to business now and take a look at your news headlines. The finance, finance minister's challenges as uh, he prepares to make his first representation of the budget speech today. President Jacob Zuma's bid to avoid establishing a commission of inquiry into allegations of state capture continues in the High Court in Pretoria today. We'll go there live a little bit later. And the police minister, Fakila Mbalula, admits that loopholes in the police force contributes to the increase in murder and armed robberies in the national crime statistics. Now those are your headlines, but before we get there, let's find out from Kendo Makamate. What's happening on the sports front? There was quite a lot happening in the world of sports. Yes, it's been a little quiet on the football front, what, mm -hmm. with, the, uh, what with all the different cup competitions that have been going on. But you know what? There's still enough going on. T20 coming up very soon. Good morning to you. This is what we have for you in the sports today. It did come as a surprise to me, but definitely um, I've been waiting for it for a long time and, and going to give it my best. 33 old Dolphins all rounder Robbie Freilink plans to make the most of his surprise call up to the T20 side to play Bangladesh. We haven't won anything yet, as yet. And obviously I've experienced and I've tasted what it's like to get all the way there and lose it. And you don't want that. Seasoned campaigner Eric Tinkler offers some sage words of advice to his team ahead of the CAF Confederations Cup final against the Fernie champions TP Mazembe. Venus 
Venus Williams beat Latvian Yelena Ostapenko in three epic hours to keep her hopes of qualifying for the WTA semi-finals alive. All this in more detail we'll have you around about 10.40. Do stay with Elvis as he's got the news. Thank you, Kendall. Top story this morning. Finance Minister Malusi Gagaba will deliver his first midterm budget policy statement today. The mini budget does not provide exact allocations, but it does set out government spending priorities for the next three years. Rating agencies will be paying close attention to the minister's speech. South Africa has already been downgraded to junk status, and they have warned government that they want to see policy that supports fiscal strength and stability. That is now the ratings agencies. Today's speech is expected to give direction on plans to deal with declining revenues and dysfunctional state-owned enterprises. Now, we'll take a short break and we'll be right back after that. With the, um, the stories of abuse from the other eight, um, but they haven't been ready to, to pursue any angles. They, they've, they've offered their support, uh, they've offered the comfort to the, to, to the eight, and it's been an amazing journey. It feels like your heart actually literally sunk in your shoes. It wasn't a long encounter. Um, uh, I think at the time uh, I froze. The way the criminal justice system deals with sexual violence is problematic. And I don't know, unless there's a fundamental change in many things, the way prosecutors deal with uh, the victim in the matter. For all investigative insights, stay tuned to Special Assignment every Saturday at 17.30. Why is there a dispute over who is the rightful heir to the throne? What I can say is that uh, Masindi is a, is a woman. She's a girl. She's a girl child. Because I think that if uh, she was a male, there's no way that anybody was going to dispute the fact that she is the rightful heir. Do you recognize her as your uh, rightful heir? Yeah, no, I, I would definitely say that she is my daughter. She grew up there. What is the intention? I want my throne. Join me in Port Zedu live every Monday to Thursday at 17.30. Now let's pick it up again. The Finance Minister Malusi Gagaba will deliver his first midterm budget policy statement today. Now the mini budget does not provide exact allocations, but it does set out government spending priorities for the next three years. Ratings agencies will be paying close attention to the minister's speech. South Africa has already been downgraded to junk status, and they have warned government that they want to see policy that supports fiscal strength and stability. Now, today's speech is expected to give direction on plans to deal with declining revenues and dysfunctional state-owned enterprises. Meanwhile, experts say that government has limited options as it battles to lower the budget deficit. As some taxes may result in unintended, unintended rather, consequences. It's a big cloud hanging. That cap needs to be closed. And unfortunately, you know, when you've got the economy that's just not growing, you know, at a fraction of a percent, we're certainly going to just see that gap widening even further. So we're not col collecting enough revenue. Um, even if you increase the taxes, you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is the contributions are still going to be significantly lower because the economy is not creating enough jobs for the people to be able to be, you know, to, to, to contribute into the fiscus. So that's the big challenge the minister will have to answer today. Um, you know, there's in a number of ways, uh, but it's not going to be a nice budget. It's not going to, it's going to be a painful one. 
Now, joining us now in Parliament is, uh, is Devon Murrigan. Uh, he's uh, in Parliament. He joins us now in Cape Town ahead of the budget speech this afternoon. Devon, a very good morning to you and welcome. Uh, looking ahead to the Minister's speech today, expectations? Yeah, that's uh, the million dollar question there, Alvis. Uh, good morning. Uh, we're in the middle of a bit of a slight drizzle and storm here at Parliament. And as I was saying earlier, not to sound cliche, but I certainly hope this is not a sign of what's to come this afternoon. Expectations, well, pretty low given the fact that the economy is not performing as it should be. Half a percent growth. We've got a budget deficit that's widening. And that's the difference between the amount of money we collect in tax revenue versus what we actually spend. Um, and we've got uncertainty in business confidence at some of its lowest levels it's ever been. So the finance minister, the newly installed finance minister, has got a task ahead of him this afternoon. All eyes on him. But perhaps one of the biggest issues uh, that we are waiting to see unfold this afternoon is the entire debacle around state-owned enterprises and its effect on the balance sheet of government. To get some insight on what we possibly could expect this afternoon, Sean Miller, uh, the uh, senior lecturer at UJ, joins us now. Uh, Sean, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Indeed, this issue of state-owned enterprises as the elephant in the room it's it's what people are looking at this afternoon 480 billion rand in guarantees associated with them this is a big issue it is a big issue um, and certainly I think for the overall medium-term budget policy statement the only good news is going to be the fact that there's some rain in Cape Town um, one of the challenges in terms of analyzing what the minister says is that the policy statement is that, it's a statement, it's a statement of intent, which means that it's not binding, unlike the budget documents themselves. Um, so although Parliament will approve certain proposals, they, they tend to be quite high level. The minister can provide as much detail as he would like. Um, and so in particular, what will be interesting to see is how they propose to find the money both to cover the SAA bailout that already took place and they took that money from something called the contingency reserve which is supposed to be for emergencies and the parliament's legal advisors already suggested this might not be uh, classified as an emergency because it was foreseeable um, where they're going to get the money to cover that and also where they're going to get the money to possibly cover an additional bailout that may be requested by lenders who don't want to roll over the debt that they've given to SAA. Yeah, you spoke about details that, are, that, that, that could possibly not come out today but the market wants that you mentioned SAA we've had this suggestion that telecom shares that government owns will be sold to cover SAA uh, weeks later reports out that that might not be the case where do you think the money will come for SAA um, at this point, it really isn't clear. The thing is, it's surprising that the government has backed off selling the telecom stake. Um, what they need to do in order to get money quite quickly is to sell relatively liquid assets, and the telecom stake is that. Furthermore, actually, some experts are of the view that government's stake in telecom has held back the ICT sector because government has excessively protected telecom because it has a stake. So in some ways, it could actually be a win-win situation for government to sell those shares, but they don't seem to be interested in doing so. So at the moment, some people have spoken about a partial privatization of SAA, but that takes time. It's not the kind of thing you can do overnight. They're going to have to, I think they're going to have to find some assets to sell. Government's under pressure, as you said, because of um, falling economic growth. Uh, there's going to be a big gap in, in revenue collection. They're going to have to introduce probably additional tax instruments and maybe cut planned expenditure. So there really isn't space to get that money from anywhere else. Uh, and previously, previous ministers committed, uh, Pravin Gordhan and Anklantla Nene, committed to selling state assets in order to capitalize or bail out state on enterprise. So if the minister does something different, if he tries to take that money from basic education, for example, um, he'll be violating that previous commitment. And I don't think uh, I don't think investors or the general public will be very happy with that. And part of the answer has to include um, improving the governance, getting rid of corruption, making sure the efficiencies are there in state-owned enterprises. It's all well and good to find the money and place it there, but how that money is used to ensure future efficiency is important. The question is whether or not the finance minister will demonstrate that this afternoon. What do you think? Well, the issue is that the the, the guidelines for what we need to do with state-owned enterprises have been around for a while. The National Development Plan had some very sensible suggestions around governance. There was a presidential review committee of state-owned entities which also had some very sensible suggestions. And those documents, those and those parts of those documents have been gathering dust. The point is there isn't the political will at the level, frankly, of the president or the cabinet to make those governance changes. Now, under previous finance ministers like Nene and Gordan, they had the will, but they didn't have the power because the finance minister themselves cannot make those changes. 
Now, the irony is Gagab is a little better, uh, it has a slightly better relationship with the president, so perhaps he might be able to get more done, but at the same time, there's reason to believe that he has less, uh, well, shall we say, less interest in the public good than the previous ministers. Um, so, yes, governance is critical because otherwise you're just pouring money into a leaky bucket. Um, but governance cannot be resolved just at the level of the finance ministry. It has to be resolved at the level of the cabinet. Yeah, final question. Not only are you just pouring money out there, but you tend to not repair the trust that has certainly incurred a deficit over the past few months. It's been six months since the finance minister is in his position. What he chooses, the route he chooses on, on, on state-owned enterprises and dealing with a budget deficit will, will work a long way to secure trust. It, it's trust that's missing here when it comes to confidence, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we saw with SAA is not just about the financial losses they're making, but when lenders just don't want to roll over their debt, you have a big problem. And all our state-owned enterprises are heavily reliant on private debt, whether or not it's guaranteed by government. So if the trust fails, they're not going to, they'll either call in debt that they're able to call in or simply not roll it over when it comes up for renewal. Um, and that could have catastrophic effects if, if there's a knock-on effect from something small, relatively small, like SAA, which can be contained, to something very large like ESCOM, which holds up to 350 billion rand in government guarantees. That cannot be contained. So if we start seeing things happening at ESCOM that are similar to SAA, say, hey, we're in very big trouble as a country. We're going to have to leave it there. Sean Muller from UJ, senior lecturer. Thanks very much indeed. And from a very wet Cape Town, uh, we leave you now back to Johannesburg. More coverage coming out throughout the morning and afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Devon Murrigan from Cape Town, in, from Parliament. Of course, that's just ahead of the Minister's budget speech this afternoon. All looking forward to that. It's a big day for South Africa. Now, Looking at other news, making headlines, the National Prosecuting Authority says it will open three dockets against the former security policeman who gave evidence at the reopened inquest of apartheid activist Ahmed Timol's death. Now, they all face charges uh, of perjury, while the former Sergeant Jan Rodriguez will also face a charge of being an accessory. Uh, accessory rather. Earlier this month, the Pretoria High Court uh, Judge Billy Montle uh, overturned a 1972 ruling that Timor had committed suicide by jumping off the 10th floor of what was then known as the John Foster Police Station, finding that security police had murdered Timor. The case was reopened after new evidence was discovered. President Jacob Zuma's lawyers have strongly attacked the state of capture report by the former public protector Tuli Madonsela, uh, saying it's uh, only based on allegations and suspicion with no factual findings. The president has approached the High Court in Pretoria to review and set aside Madonsela's remedial actions calling for the Chief Justice to appoint a judge that will head up a commission of inquiry into state capture. President Zuma's lawyers are tearing into the state capture report. They want the recommended remedial actions declared unconstitutional as only the president has the power to appoint a commission of inquiry. Along with this, the president wants the report sent back to the public protector's office for further investigation. Here, the argument is that the report did not make any factual findings of wrongdoing by anyone. It's only suspicion. She can't report on suspicions or she can't report on allegations. She must investigate those. And having investigated them, she must then make a finding. Because what are you remedying if you haven't made a finding of impropriety? The public protector's legal team, however, argued that Madoncella could not make conclusive findings due to a lack of capacity, but this does not take away from her remedial actions. She did not have the necessary resources, the necessary capacity, and the necessary funds to make conclusive findings of fact. Also in court, the EFF arguing that the president cannot be given free reign in exercising his responsibility to appoint a commission of inquiry when he may be implicated. The president might be conflicted if, as uh, Mr. Tulima Donsela put it, he became a judge and jury in his own case. It is, in my respectful submission, the duty of the court to ensure that that conflict, potential conflict of interest, is in fact avoided. 
The matter is being heard by a full bench consisting of three judges. Judge President Mlambo particularly had questioned what President Zuma has done as the head of state to deal with state capture aside from trying to protect himself with various court actions. Sipo Sterman, SBC News in Pretoria. As soon as the court resumes, we'll go there live. Meanwhile, the police minister, Fakilam Balula, says that decisive leadership is needed in the fight against crime. Speaking to SABC News this morning, Mbalula also raised concerns about rising incidents of sexual offences and crime that is fueled by alcohol abuse. The women have been raped and some of the cases are not coming forward. Where they come forward, they have been bungled. We need to admit that is why the minister introduced six-point plan so that our police station must respond. We've got uh, F FCS, uh, I mean we've got uh, victim support rooms in all the police station to address this particular matter. Illegal shippings, over-circulation of alcohol in our communities, uh, too much access of alcohol uh, in our communities. How do we deal with that? Over the weekends, especially? Uh, that's when people drown themselves. Minister Mutualeri tells me, not me, him, he says that South Africa is ranked 10th drunkard nation in the world. Obviously, we can't fold our arms and, and want to be drunk and become a nation of drunkards. We must respond to that. And that's the reason we pose this question to you on our poll, and let's take a look where it stands. Are the crime stats that the minister reflected on yesterday are they a true reflection of your experience? Well, so far, 158 votes in. I would like to get your experience, your personal experience, right, from wherever you live in this country. So, so far, 66% of you are saying that the crime stats does not reflect the true reflection. Somebody said earlier uh, that uh, most of the crimes are not reported. 34% are saying yes. Let's take a look at what you are telling us in relation to this. Rangwani says, hell no. Let me just say... I hate the SAPS and the NPA. They are worse than the criminals that rob, rape and kill us. They are useless. Well, that's an allegation there that is strident. Uh, Michael Big M says, no, but what we see out there is some scary stuff, especially hijackings, cash and transit robberies, muggings, multi killings are on the rise. And this one from Lakhasa Molo says, I really don't trust the minister Mbalula. He is illegitimate. Why would you say that? Well, these are some of your comments. Please keep them coming. We'll read those comments as we continue during the course of the day. Participate in the conversation. It is a true reflection uh, of what is currently happening in our country. Uh, yes, it, uh, crime is increasing, they say. Now, memorial service of late National Health Department spokesperson Joe Mahila takes place in Polokwane today. The service is open to the public. Maila allegedly accidentally shot himself at a shooting range last Thursday. At the time of his death, he worked closely with the health minister, Aaron Motsaledi. Maila served as a spokesperson for the Ministry of Health since May 2012. The minister said his spokesperson was a hard worker. The Parliament's Health Portfolio Committee also lauded Maila for his work, describing him as a true professional who had good working relations with the committee and everyone in the department and the media. His funeral will take place uh, this coming Saturday, October the 28th, at Porter's House Church in Ivy Park in Polokwane. The family has expressed their sincere appreciation and gratitude for all the messages and support that they've received from friends, colleagues, government and the public at large. Maila survived by his mother, wife and two children. Rest in peace, dear brother. Well, there you have it. Let's now take a look at uh, our social trends and what's happening on social media. We start off with hashtag crime stats. There you have it. We talked about the increase in crime and look at the numbers as you can see them there. Uh, the Gauteng, of course, uh, up 6.7%, uh, 2.2% in KZN, the highest affected, and as well as the Eastern Cape. They down by 0.6% and to look at all the other provinces up there 11% that's the biggest scary part there in Pumalanga if you see that number uh, jump up there there you see police minister Fakil Balula says that saps alone cannot root out violent crime in South Africa briefing parliament's portfolio committee on the 2016-17 annual crime statistics 
He again called on communities to cooperate with police in the fight against crime. Mbulula says while crime in general has declined, contact crime such as murder and robbery have shown an upward trend. And that is what we want to find out from you. How has it affected you on ground level? Now, meanwhile, President Jacob Zuma's executive powers will today remain under the spotlight in the High Court in Pretoria in the so-called State Capture Review case. Zuma is seeking to challenge the remedial actions of the former public protector, advocate Tuli Madonsela's State of Capture report on grounds that she did not have the powers to instruct the head of state. Hashtag State Capture. And then there's another hashtag, UCT Shutdown. Lectures were interrupted and a library evacuated as an estimated 1,000 University of Cape Town students marched on the campus yesterday afternoon to demand free higher education. Students promised to shut down the university until a list of six demands were met and promised to escalate mass action in the weeks to come. Is it the right place to march at your university? That's the question, ask one. Well, the finance minister, he's got a big day ahead of him, Alusi Gagaba. He will present his maiden midterm budget policy statement in Parliament this afternoon. The speech is expected to shed some light on how government plans to function in an economy of declining revenue and stunted growth. Meanwhile, the University of Cape Town has confirmed that students are planning to march to Parliament, where Gigawa will deliver his midterm budget statement this afternoon. Spokesperson Elijah Moholola says that they will march to demand free education and for the president, Jacob Zuma, to release the much-anticipated fees commission report. Hashtag midterm budget. Now, picture of the day comes from uh, SJ Coalition, the hard numbers. SJ says that the daily burden that communities across South Africa face, hashtag crime stats, and there you see that uh, stat on your screen right there. 19016, 140,956 murder and robbery up. The comment of the day comes from Tumi So. Sadly, these stats talk to reported crimes. There's tons of crimes not reported due to uh, the view that cops won't act. Now, that is a very disturbing one. If you can't trust the police, who can you trust? Who are you going to call? Let's now take a look at what's happening in court. In court today, President Jacob Zuma's executive powers will remain in the spotlight in the Pretoria High Court in the so-called State Capture Review case. The president is seeking to challenge the remedial action of the former public protector Tuli Marancela's state of capture report on grounds that she did not have the powers to instruct the head of state, which is the president, to do so. And further afield to Kenya now, the Supreme Court there will hold a last-minute hearing to decide whether to rerun the country's presidential election tomorrow or not. The court will hear an urgent petition by civil society and rights group uh, groups rather to have the vote cancelled. That's a day before it's supposed to take place. As you know, it's supposed to, to run. Now we'll keep you updated with the developments on those cases. Let's throw forward to tomorrow. On the show, we'll continue to look into the life and times of former ANC President Oliver Reginald Tumbo, known as OR. Now this coming Friday is the Oliver Tumbo's, is Oliver Tumbo's birthday and uh, if he was living he would be 100 years old. We'll celebrate that on Friday. You don't want to miss it. But we'll take a short break. We'll be right back after that. that the former minister is now endorsing Ramaphosa as the next president. Hmm. Campaign time, Puff. Yeah. So early. Let, let's um, at least uh, accept uh, that people have a right uh, to expressing themselves in terms of uh, the, who they support. But what is lacking very seriously is that there is no that leadership uh, role that is played by the leadership to say we haven't opened succession and let us deal with those that are campaigning openly because we haven't opened it as the leadership of the ANC. What we need in this country is that the, we need a ruling party or a leading party to be able to engage with issues that affect the people. Our people campaign 
openly. It weakens the, the, the organization. In fact, it makes the, the policies of the ANC even more popular. Stay tuned to Media Monitor and catch on analysts unpacking top stories every Sunday from 9 a.m. Zoli Leenkakani, MK veteran and the former Inspector General of Intelligence, began his career as a political activist and a member of the African National Congress in 1958 at the University of Fort Hare. Now, while studying at Fort Hare, he was directed by the ANC to go into exile to pursue further studies and undertake military, military training, where he met O.R. Tambo in Tanzania. He subsequently went to Lusaka where he held various positions, uh, various positions rather, and worked alongside OR. Now for more on this, we're joined in our Pretoria studios by Zolile Nkakani. A very good morning to you, sir, and welcome. Good morning, and thanks to your listeners. First and foremostly, I want you to reflect back to those many years when you went into exile and spent some time with OR Tambo. Tell us more about your journey and when you first met him. Yes, I left South Africa in 1962. Mm -hmm. We left for the Soviet Union then to do undertake studies. We studied, I studied for chemical engineering. Uh, Completing my studies, I went for military training, and after that was deployed in Tanzania at Congo camp. From Congo camp in Tanzania, I then went to Lusaka, the headquarters of MK. And there I had the privilege to work under O.R. Tambo. Now, this was really a privilege to me because O. R. Tambo was a very learned person, but he was an all-rounded human being. Around him, you felt comfortable. He was not intimidating. And I think his background in teaching helped him also pass on his knowledge, his vast knowledge to you as you worked with him. He was a very humble man, but he was a man who was able to, I believe, get the best out of you. He was a very respected leader. As I said, an all-rounded person mm -hmm. who was firm, but really was gentle and very considerate in the work. Yeah. Some would say that he was firm and fair, but o they also said, and of course we had a number of interviews during the course of, of, the, of the week, that he was a workaholic. He worked seven days a week. What would you say to us about his work ethic and how it influenced you? Oh, he was a very hard worker. Uh, and I think, you know, on his shoulders, as everybody will tell you, that O.R., 
is the one who kept the ANC together under very difficult uh, conditions. And therefore, I think his hard work paid off because we also felt that we had to do likewise. We couldn't, you know, slack because the task was very difficult. Remember in those days, uh, whilst in, in Lusaka, uh, uh, Southern Rhodesia was not free. Uh, so to accomplish sending back trained uh, MK cadres to South Africa was a huge task. Mm -hmm. Even inside the country at, th at that time, after the internal leadership had been arrested, they, it was difficult sending someone to South Africa when you didn't have any people to receive them. So we had actually to start from scratch. And OR had to make sure that he mobilizes uh, international support for the efforts that we are doing, both in terms of hardware as well as making an understanding of what, where the ANC stands. In Africa, a lot of work had to, to be done because the ANC sometimes was not understood because the Africanist, Pan-Africanist view was more receptive to them. So mm -hmm. it was hard work to convince the uh, African uh, leadership that ANC had a role to play in the liberation of South African struggle. Mm -hmm. Now, during the liberation struggle, it wasn't all plain sailing because I want to take you back to the Mogorogoro conference in 1958, or 59 rather, where the leadership of OR was, uh, was questioned, so to speak. But can you reflect on that situation at that point in time? Uh, I wouldn't say that the leadership of OR was questioned. As I said, at that time we were passing through, it was a very hard phase. Mm. Um, the memorandum that was put out by uh, a number of our ANC cadres returning from prison in, in Botswana raised very pertinent issues about the direction in which we were going, also about the culture that had what that was at the time afflict, afflicting the ANC. And therefore, OR played a very prominent role in ensuring that there was overall consultation, not consultation not only in the African theater, but also of all ANC members and cadres who were scattered all over the world. And also uh, attempts were made to make sure that there is adequate consultation with our internal machinery. So the Morogoro Conference, remember, couldn't represent all the people of South Africa. We had only the MK cadres who were outside there and some of the ANC entities that were spread all over the world. And yet we had to go to a conference in which momentous decisions were going to be made. It was an elective conference. And OR, you know, going to the camps to listen to what the cadres there were complaining about, but also what contribution they wanted, what direction they wanted the organization to take. He, you, and, and they, were, <laughs> they were talking to him and he was listening to them and there were no holes barred. All uh, issues were on the table and OR had to go through that. Mm -hmm. At the conference itself, what, what, what happened is that after the, the, as the program went and it reached the situation, uh, the, the stage where elections had to take place, OR himself indicated that he was not available for election. Wow, you should have seen <laughs> what impact that had on us. 
who were we, a small group, to, to change, you know, what the people of South Africa had, had done. It was a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. But our elders who were there, Uncle J.B., Max, um, Moses Kotani, Abida, they went and s talked to him. And he came back and stood for elections. And he was elected unanimously. Mm -hmm. So it was not a question of questioning OR's leadership. Yes. It was a question of making sure that some of the changes that the Kailas wanted. For instance, we wanted the ANC now to open up its membership to all South Africans, not only to uh, Africans, black Africans, but also to the colored organizations, the Indians, the white, could become full members of the ANC, so that the ANC, in representing the alliance, could, could do so effectively, and the membership could participate in the affairs of the organization inside. And well, also, the strategy and tactics of the way forward was also mapped out. And then finally, sir, do you think that that was his dream, to see a united South Africa? And, of course, how should South Africans, in general, remember O.R. Tambo? Yes, I think O.R. wanted to see a united South Africa. And I think where he is, it's appropriate that in celebrating his 100th year anniversary, we should heed his call. You know, the call that I think today OR would have made to all of us would go something like, all of us should make the RSA eminently governable that it is a task for all of us to make the RSA eminently governed for achieving, or the purpose for achieving sustainable social economic liberation for all in our life lifetime. I am sure he would indicate that it is urgent that that task should be made and fulfilled, and it should be carried by all of us. My good sir, I thank you so much for being with us today and giving us your message to South Africans. Thank you. That was Zolile Mkagani. He is an MK veteran and a former Inspector General of Intelligence reflecting on the life and times of Oliver Tambo, Oliver Reginald Tambo, OR. It's the entire week. We're building up towards the celebrations on Friday. You don't want to miss it. Let's now take a look at the front pages from the newspapers from around the globe. And we start off in the Big Apple in New York in the U.S. The Wall Street Journal reports that fault lines within the Republican Party cracked further as feuding between President Donald Trump and senators intensified within the U.S. Capitol. Well, was that expected or not? Moving to Europe. The Times says that blood thinning drugs takes to, uh, taken to prevent strokes may dramatically reduce the risk of dementia. That is what a study found there. And there's also Heathrow runaway, uh, runway doubt after new data revealed. That's on the front page there. And then finally in Australia, The Age reports that a 43-year-old disability pensioner from Melbourne after outer suburbs is suspected of funneling cash to the uh, American-born senior Islamic State fighter. Well, those are your newspapers from around the globe. Now, before we take a break, let me ask you that question again, remind you of that question that we posed to you this morning. It's all about you. We want to find out uh, what do you think, and let's put it on the screen. What do you want the Minister of Finance to address in the mini-budget today at 2 o'clock? What are you expecting to highlight? Let's take a look at what you're telling us. Michael says, pumping more money into education at Moy Plaza, says Michael. Kadani says his intentions to quietly step down. Well, Desley says the problem the government, the problem with the government is they spend more money than what they budget because the country is in junk status already. Well, so says Desley. 
Colin Sintelele says, I hope that he should include in his speech that he won't put his signature on that dubious nuclear deal. Ha! Well, there you have it. Those are your comments. Of course, you can keep them coming. We'll read them as we continue. But we're also conducting a poll. I'd like to find out from you. What do you think of this? Let's put up the poll and, well, in fact, uh, so no tweets on the poll, but let's take a look at the poll. Can we put up the, the new poll that uh, has been refreshed and revised? Well, it's still on 145. It's not been refreshed, but there it is. Are the uh, crime stats a true reflection of your experience? So, so far, there is 177 votes in. There is 34% uh, of you in South Africa and on the African continent are suggesting that the crime stats, stats are a true reflection of your experience. Only 66% are saying no. There, we'll read some of those comments a little bit later, but we'll take a break right now and we'll be back right after that. A top five rated horse racing event in the world, fashion is a highlight for those in attendance. All decked out in blue and white, the Lomorians Queen Plate is the premier event that kicked off everyone's social calendar. That was all part of my master plan to cast John Legend, but deprive him of his normal instrument and give that one to Ryan. The House of Truth is not just a name. It is a religion, it is a lifestyle, it is a conviction that drives us. What really excites me is how people have kept it very simple and also played with the theme and how each person has interpreted it in their own way. To stay updated with all the current entertainment news, tune into Trends every Saturday from 12 to 1. Twenty seventeen has been declared by government as the year of OR Tumbo. Now this as the struggle stalwart would have turned one hundred this year. We spoke to ANC Deputy Secretary General Jesse Duarte, who worked in Tumbo's office in Lusaka in Zambia. I did meet a uh, uh, comrade uh, Oliver Tumbo once in Sweden. I met him in London. I also met him in Lusaka. Uh, several times when we had briefings and, and one point he asked for a very particular briefing um, and I w uh, we went through Botswana and went uh, to meet with him in Lusaka but I wasn't fortunate enough uh, uh, to work with such an, a great man. I did work with other great men but yeah. not with him. Yeah, yes. we, we, we know your yes. association with some <laughs> of the great men and, and, yes. and we'll focus on Mandela yes. next year because yes. the same thing is yes. going to be celebrated right. next year for the 100. But let's focus on our Tambo. Yes. Your first meeting, mm. your first encounter with him. Um, my very first encounter with him was in, in fact in London uh, when I went on a trip with Albertina Sisulu and uh, Sister Bernard Nube. And we had been t to the US and the UK um, to, as part of a UDF delegation, to meet with the leadership of those countries uh, to talk about uh, the, the, the freedom of our country, the issue of sanctions and why we, we thought sanctions were so important. Um, and, and he came to London to come and debrief us. Mm. And I, I remember the person uh, who introduced me to him it was very late at night said to me afterwards, he says, you, um, you just didn't talk for a long time, you just stared at him. I, I don't remember that, but <laughs> I probably did just that, you know, because yeah. every song we sang here in the country was about him. Yeah. Every, um, he, was, he was really the, the struggle and the inspiration of our struggle. 
at home, Amazing. you know, because mm -hmm. um, I'm truly a great man. I mean, you, uh, you say inspiring. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. that was the key to his leadership as well. Yes. Because if you had yes. to describe him as a leader, and what I'm gathering from you, and yes. you know, when you when you're awestruck by somebody, yes. you just yes. stare at them. Yes, absolutely. They inspire people. Yes, he did. And I think uh, LB, um, Justice LB Sachs puts it so beautifully. He says that you can, if you read the Constitution of South Africa, the DNA of Oliver Tambo runs through it. Mm -hmm. And if you read every speech he's written, and he did write his own speeches, I'm told he did that. Yeah. Um, and if you read the books about him and the things that are said about him and you read the Constitution, then the elements of humanity of humaneness, of um, equality, of justice, of uh, never fearing to fight for freedom, uh, never fearing to confront that which might stand in the way of any of, of, those, of those things we hold dearly, which is uh, peace, equality, justice, um, um, you know, and, and, and end to poverty. That was O.R.'s, uh, yeah. that was his, his, yeah, his inner being, I think. He was, um, he was remarkable in that sense. And he gave inspiration to other great men. I mean, Thabo Mbeki worked closely to him. Mm. Uh, President Zuma worked closely to him. Um, and, and remember, he was the ANC's leader for 40 years during the toughest times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, during setting up external missions in uh, over 100 countries. Uh, making sure that South Africa, we received support for a military war um, from Conto Wesiswe. Not an easy thing to do, um, uh, especially when the West, the UK and the USA regarded us as terrorists. Yeah. Um, you know, he worked with the, with the Nordic countries in particular, with uh, the, U, you know, the USSR, then Russia, now, and the Chinese, and uh, brought uh, many comforts to people in the camps, yeah. uh, although the camps were not the best places to be, but certainly, you know, they were clothing, the food, and the weapons. And, and we mustn't say that there wasn't a war. Yeah. And O.R. Uh, Tambo understood that you, when you're fighting a just war, you also have to teach people a particular level of morality. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, civilian, uh, civilians were not targeted. Uh, directly in, yeah, yeah. in by the, by in, in where, um, I just want to I want to bring it to, mm -hmm. to modern day and where we're yes. sitting right now mm -hmm. and talk about the fact that I mean you yourself have been quoted as saying that mm -hmm. um, the leadership now contradicts <coughs> what O.R. Tambo stood for. I think to an extent uh, many do. I, I you know I don't want to pick on any specific yeah. leader, but I think in in general terms the ANC has come through quite a difficult two years, in the last two years, with a lot of introspection. And when you introspect, one of the things that happens is the things you say about yourself almost become legend. Yeah. Um, and and uh, what that inspires is for more criticism to come your way, which is fine. Um, it's been good for us. Uh, going back on the ground uh, now, as we've, as we've been doing, we're finding that people are discussing values uh, and what they want to see happening in local communities. Indeed. Uh, less of the debate about what should happen at a macro national uh, level, but what's going to happen here in my backyard, mm. uh, here where I live. Um, a more consciousness about servicing the people directly. And, and of course that doesn't get to the media because it hasn't been helpful to take the media along on those kind of uh, discussions because okay. there's distortion. Um, what, what I must just say I have found in doing that with others is that yeah. people are beginning to evaluate the quality of the services that we provide as a governing party. Yeah. But more than that, uh, as a leadership on the ground, how they are beginning to be seen. And there's worry about that. Thank you very much. Let's take a look at what's happening in terms of your weather for today. We're going to take a look first of all at the uh, southern parts of South Africa. Here we're seeing a cold front moving through the area and 
of course, what this means for today is a little bit of rainfall, cooler conditions, and of course, that wet weather is going to be very warmly welcomed by Cape Town and surrounding areas. Definitely need it there. Now, we're also seeing afternoon showers and thunder showers forecast for the eastern parts of the country, extending through into parts of Botswana, into parts of Namibia and Angola as well. Uh, of course, as we move through into tomorrow, this is going to uh, change. We're going to see that low pressure moving off towards the east. That's going to draw in the slightly heavier rainfall towards South Africa's eastern regions and extending into parts of the high felt as well. Once again, we see those isolated showers moving through and towards Angola. Stronger showers forecast for Central Africa. Let's take a look in a little bit more detail what's happening now. Cape Town's at 18 degrees Celsius. We've already seen quite a bit of precipitation in Cape Town and we're due to see even more today. Now we are seeing cloudy conditions in the area as well. Temperatures are going to remain very warm in the interior in the 30s for the most part or at least the higher 20s. Taking a look now a little bit further north at our neighboring states, uh, capital cities uh, around the area. Well, they're peaking warm. Vintuk, 31 degrees. Temperatures in Khabarone, 37. Harare, 32. And Maputo peaks at 39 degrees Celsius. Now, some very, very hot conditions on continental Africa. Let's see what's happening in the island regions. Well, stable conditions here. 26 to 33 degree maximums. No uh, rainfall forecast at the moment, just cloud cover. What we are seeing, though, are those warm conditions warming up even more into the Central African region. Now, there's a lot more cloud cover here, of course, but what we are seeing here are conditions around 32 degrees in Kinshasa and Lilongwe. As we move around towards Dar es Salaam, we see some showers coming in, and the rainfall continues all the way as far north as Bangui. And, uh, of course, you can see that rainfall extending towards West Africa's southern coastline as well. Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, surrounding areas are expecting isolated showers for today. That extends through in towards Somalia. Some uh, rainfall forecast for the western parts of Somalia there. And the northern coastline, uh, especially around Libya, receiving some showers both today and tomorrow. But, uh, yes, mostly concentrated around the coast. Not penetrating very far south at all there. Showers continue towards West Africa's southern coastline there. And, of course, we see that continuing in terms of the sunshine as well. Let's take a look at that. Khartoum, sunny again, 39 degrees Celsius. Temperatures in Mecca at 37, Jerusalem 25, and Cairo at 31. Tripoli is also 31, but today might just see some showers coming through the area. So only isolated showers, not particularly strong there. Very similar forecast for Abidjan and Lagos on the uh, southern coastline there of West Africa. Uh, of course, these areas do expect some thunderstorms, so it is going to be a little bit different. But nonetheless, we're going to see some precipitation in the area. Drier towards Bamako, Dakar, expecting warm temperatures with Bamako at 38 degrees and Nyame at 40. This, of course, is where we're going to leave your weather for now. Stay with us here on SABC. Andy, what did you make of the social media reaction to the news of the death of Makak? People are trying to grapple with the reasons why this is happening. I yeah. don't think that's being explained nearly enough. Professor? KZN has got a history of this factionalism. Why are police not getting to the bottom of the scourge? It's a national disaster that we still are dealing with political killings. Professor Daniels, just who do you think is behind these killings then? Let me put you on the spot there. The problems in this country started when the scorpions were disbanded. And is that what we're going to be seeing now? Deaths. Deaths, smear campaigns and stuff like that. It's got to stop. Stay tuned to Media Monitor and catch on analysts unpacking top stories every Sunday from 9 a.m.
25th of October 2017 on this Wednesday, Jumbo Africa. This is the second hour here in the newsroom. I'm Elvis Preslin. We'll be with you until 12 o'clock today. Now today we focus on crime and the crime stat scandal that has come out yesterday. Very disturbing. Absolutely. Uh, murder and robbery has gone up and a lot of people have got questions uh, that need answering. But we want to find out from you, what do you think? Are the crime stats a true reflection of your personal experience? Well, 186 percent, 67 uh, 67 percent are saying no, it does not, and only 33 percent are suggesting yes. But you're also tweeting us. John Smith says it's so easy to fabricate stats, and worse, the minister reads stats that he probably doesn't understand. Where is the PCA plan? Desley says, let's uh, let us all work together, the police and the community. We can win. Now, that is a good suggestion, Leslie, because it's always been there. We have community forums, police forums, and mm. we need to work together with the police. It's not just the police. You need to work together with your police in order to sort out your area. But mm. we're also focusing on the finance minister. It's a big day for the finance minister. It's the mini budget today, Kendall. His first, his maiden budget. And let's hope that uh, we hear everything that we want to hear from him. But we want to find out from you, what is it that you want the minister of finance to address in his mini budget? Let's take a look at what you're telling us. Collins uh, says, I hope that he should include in his speech that he won't put his signature on the dubious nuclear deal. Oh, yes. And John Smith says he must start a CIP department, analyze where he can improve and save costs on the current government projects, spend money to save money. Those are some of your comments. Please keep them coming. Uh, we also have a sporting question for you. Eric Tinkler, he, uh, does he have the mojo? Absolutely. That's the question. Want to find out? Has he found that formula to succeed on the continent? He's about to go into his fourth, uh, fourth uh, African final. This after his assistant coach uh, and coach to Pirates. Now, EFF 2019 mission says, I think so, because he's been there for several times. He knows what to expect when you go out there. And his experience speaks for itself. There you go. It's actually going to be his third final. This one from Olomisa says he's on the right direction. We must just wait and see. Well, there you have it. Those are some of your comments. Please keep them coming. We'll read them as we continue. But right now, let's get down to business and take a look at your news headlines. Talking about business and finance, the finance minister's budget challenges as he prepares to make his first presentation today in the mini budget. President Jacob Zuma's bid to avoid establishing a commission of inquiry into allegations of state capture is expected to start any minute from now. The High Court in Pretoria will go there live. And Police Minister Vakila Mbalula admits that loopholes in the police force contributes to the increase in murder and armed robberies in the national crime statistics. Now those are all your headlines. Let's find out from Kendo Makamate. What's up? on the sports front. Elvis, thank you very much. A busy day you've got, but you know what? We've also got a little bit of sports that we can uh, make sure that we keep you informed with. Good morning to you. This is what we have for you today. It did come as a surprise to me, but definitely um, I've been waiting for it for a long time and, and going to give it my best. 33-year-old Dolphins all-rounder Robbie Freilink plans to make the most of his surprise call-up to the T20 side to play Bangladesh. We haven't won anything yet, as yet. And obviously I've experienced and I've tasted what it's like to get all the way there and lose it. And you don't want that. Season campaigner Eric Tinkler offers some sage words of advice to his team ahead of the CAF Confederations Cup final against defending champions TP Mazembe. Venus Williams beats Latvian Yelena Ostapenko in three epic hours to keep her hopes of qualifying for the WTA semi-finals well alive. In more detail, we'll have all of this, but do stay with Elvis as he's got more riveting news for you. Thank you, Kendall. Top story this hour. The Finance Minister Malusi Gagaba will deliver his first midterm budget policy statement today. The mini-budget does not provide exact allocations, but it does set out government spending priorities for the next three years. Rating agencies will be paying close attention to the minister's speech. South Africa has already been downgraded to junk status and they've warned government that they want to see policy that supports fiscal strength and stability. Today's speech is expected to give direction on uh, plans to deal with declining revenues and dysfunctional state-owned enterprises. 
Now, we will be crossing to Cape Town again for more on the midterm budget uh, at around, uh, uh, around about uh, half past 10 or even 11 o'clock, depending on when we have uh, Devon Morgan ready there. Uh, we'll see if he is ready to give us an update there. But right now, the proceedings of the state capture court case in Pretoria is underway. Let's go there live. Uh, I want to read there against the letter from 10 to 16. This is President Zuma uh, replying to uh, Advocate Marto himself. He says, yes, the, now I think as you made the point that the matter is about me and my advisors are employed to advise me, I'm definitely willing to answer the questions. And this is the important part. He says, because I have now come to know that I am implicated. Uh, and then he, he refers to, to other materials. Uh, uh, and I'm simply making that, that reference to, to indicate that he himself realized that he was now being treated as an implicated person. The next reference is um, in the founding affidavit. Paragraph 60 of the founding affidavit. This is the, the affidavit of President Zuma, where he says, the purpose of the remedial action was to ensure that I am not the judge and jury in my own case, as determined by the public protector and provided in paragraph 8.3 of the remedial action. Following the remedial action, I would indeed be acting as judge and jury in my own cause. It's supposed to be cause, I'm sure, uh, misprint. Since the commission of inquiry would be reporting to me for my action or inaction on this recommendation. Again, uh, I will make, I'm just referring the court to that without making any, any more motivational uh, argument. <coughs> Now, going back to the issues of the, of the, of the powers, I, I established yesterday with respect, uh, uh, and I won't reproduce that ground, that we all accept. In fact, that's exactly where we started. The judge president uh, made the remark to Mr. Semenya correctly that nobody in this room uh, questions the fact that the president has the power to appoint, which is quite so. The only point I made yesterday was simply that uh, as, as, as a matter of law, the president's power is not unfettered uh, or un, untrammeled. And that as a matter of fact, the recommendation, the recommended, or rather the remedial action does restrict uh, his power. So the only question really that the court has to ask is whether that restriction of his power is uh, rational, justifiable in the circumstances and so on. So there's no debate about, about, about the fact that actually the power is restricted. And how is it restricted? The, the way it is restricted in my respectful submission, and I think that there's a, a bit of confusion about this, uh, both in the, in the public domain and uh, uh, unfortunately I, I even on my head the public protector this morning on the radio making this, this, this same mistake. The public protector did not ask the Chief Justice to appoint the commission. Well, that's the, yes. the that well, decision still is with the president. Absolutely. He must appoint the commission. He must appoint. Yeah, he must take the decision to establish a commission. Absolutely. He must, he, he, that's correct, uh, JJP. He must take the decision to establish the commission, but she uses exactly that word. He must appoint as he's entitled to, to appoint. The only restriction that has been given to his power to appoint 
is the power to select or nominate. I think she uses the word nominate in 8.4. In other words, she simply says that he must appoint, but he must appoint a judge who has been selected or nominated by the Chief Justice. And I think it's very important to put that. That's the restriction you put. That's the restriction we, we, we would like to justify. Or at the very, that the onus is on the other side to say it's, it's irrational. Yeah. So I, I may have missed something in my preparation. Do you guys have a case <coughs> authority that would be on, on all fours or maybe close to what you're proposing? No, no, not specifically. Uh, uh, Has, have the courts ever dealt with this? No, no, not, not in this fashion. The, the, the only submission I could make, uh, Judge President, is that it is, well, start with the broader proposition. But actually, that's what the public protector does. Yes. The public protector, as a matter of, 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 of everyday practice, uh, restricts the power, directs the power of ministers, DGs, whoever is in the, in the administration. Mm. And as we have put it in our heads, her power to do so is even wider than that of the courts, mm. uh, in the sense that she is able to uh, encroach quite openly and say, you can't do this, you can't give this tender, you can't, you, you, you know, uh, because that's what she does. Yeah. So it is a matter of, of, of what she does. And there's no question of separation of powers and all those uh, uh, fancy fancy arguments. Yeah. Actually, the public protector can even interfere with the, with the court if it's not, that's why the, in, in, in the public protector's act, there's a specific section that says the public protector may not uh, investigate a court's decision because it wants to make it clear that a court's decision is something else, that's a judgment. Yes. But if there's an allegation of corruption in the court or a judge has taken a bribe or whatever, the, the public protector is at large to... to, to uh, Mr. Budlender's head suggests that if if this this power was Unrestricted. When it comes to the public protector, she would, or the public protector would forever be hobbled oh, uh, in doing her work. I think yeah. that's the that's the argument. That, that, that's the argument. Yeah. yeah. It, would, it, it, it would simply be the, the whole notion of what the constitutional court called mm -hmm. not just white powers, but very white powers. Yeah. Uh, at, at page 68 of the of the panel. Um, uh, sorry, Mr. Mpopo, before you get on to that, um, it seems to me as a matter of constitutional construction, the express mention of that restriction on her powers, by implication means, does it not, that she has all the rest of the widest, of the widest ambit, Absolutely. and that's, that's the surest no, indication as of what the ambit of her powers really are. Yes, <laughs> that's correct. The argument is simply that if if there was such a restriction as uh, what the applicant wishes to invent, then that restriction would, would be contained in section 182. In section yeah. 182, would said would have said uh, the public protector has the power to uh, when there are allegations to investigate them, yes. to uh, report on them. Right. And only when she has made a finding, then she must uh, issue remedial action. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 no reading of Section 182 or the Act can ever support that, that conclusion. On the, contrary, on the contrary, what we have is a, a clear intention to give the widest possible power, subject obviously to, for example, that she can't uh, 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 look into court judgments. And in the recent cases, the, the uh, Reserve Bank cases, she obviously also can't um, investigate something that is not part of the complaint. Yes. So those are the, the, the usual restrictions that are, that are there. But apart from that, uh, at, at uh, paragraph 68 of, uh, of, of the um, bundle of the applicant, Paragraph 53 of the EFF case. <clears throat> the Constitutional Court says hers are indeed very wide powers. <coughs> not just wide, as if wide is not enough. Very wide powers 
that leave no level of government power about, above scrutiny, uh, coincidental embarrassment, and censure. This is a necessary service because state resources belong to the public, as does state power. And then it says, the repositories of these resources and power are to use them on behalf and for the, the benefit of the public. And then uh, a, a point that emphasizes the, the point I made yesterday. When this is suspected or known to be so, then the public deserves protection. And that protection has been constitutionally entrusted to the public protector. This finds support in what this court said in the certification case, namely, quote, members of the public aggrieved by the conduct of government officials should be able to lodge complaints with the public protector who will investigate them and take appropriate remedial action. Can be clearer than that. that let, me, let me just understand that submission. Yes, <coughs> Based on what you've just read, yes, Constitutional Court confirms with the widest powers yeah, in terms of any level of government. Absolutely. And the one that's recorded is against court judgment. Yes. That you can go. Yes. That's the power to scrutinize. Yes. Is your argument that she can't just scrutinize? She can scrutinize, and once she finds something, she can't be restrained in terms of the remedial action she can Absolutely. give. It's the same power. That's correct, Malin. What you're saying is that the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a triplet of powers, so to speak. So in Section 182, you get the, the, the governing clause. Yeah. That says she has the power and allegations and suspicions and so on and so on. But it then says to, to do what? To investigate, and then it says to report on that conduct, as was uh, emphasized yesterday. In other words, on that conduct, the alleged or suspected conduct, and to take remedial action. There's no restriction whatsoever. Uh, on, 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 on all the, the, the three powers, all are susceptible to the governing uh, <coughs> section of, 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 of 182 uh, uh, 1. Yeah. And, 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 and the. the, the, the the next paragraph is, is that in the, in the execution of investigative reporting or remedial power, again, we get them trusted, the, those powers, without any, any distinction. She is not inhibited. She is not to be in inhibited, undermined, or sabotaged. When all other essential requirements for the proper exercise of her power are met, she is to take appropriate remedial action. If I may pause there. That then takes us to what is the meaning of appropriate? And appropriate clearly, uh, here you might, one might find the analogies to uh, the, the, the whole question of appropriate remedies in terms of section 172. Appropriate remedy of the Constitutional Court, or any court for that matter, in terms of section 172, is the power for, the, for a court to make an example to fashion a novel uh, 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 structural uh, remedies to, to face a particular situation, uh, which is what I will talk about when we talk about remedy here. And in my respectful submission, in view of the, 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 the maxim that one has to interpret the Constitution, the same words should generally mean the same thing. That, that example can be taken here. In other words, Given a particular situation, the public protector has the widest power to fashion, as it were, particular uh, remedial action that will suit that particular case. We're not going to have another case where the president and his son and this one and this one uh, is, is, is implicated. It will always be different. So her duty is to exercise those widest powers, to look into this particular report that she's dealing with, this particular complaint, this particular co complainant, this particular uh, person, and then fashion a, an appropriate remedy, just as, as a, a court would do in a, in a constitution. Yes, and I think that the case is clear. Appropriate means effective. Uh, exactly. And, exactly. and I yes. think the authority, and I mentioned it yesterday, was FOSI. Yes, FOSI, FOSI yes, well, exactly. Uh, appropriate in terms of the, the FOSI test was, was, was defined as effective, an effective remedy. 
The, the Fonzie case, obviously... Uh, it's distinguishable on its back. Yes, it's distinguishable, but it also, uh, because it was dealing with the question of the constitu whether there's a constitutional remedy, a direct constitutional yes, remedy. But remedy. Yes, but nonetheless, it's that appropriate Absolutely. relief. Yes, and, and that was the, 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 the exact debate. It's and also in the EFF case, uh, Justice Barakovic, that is confirmed, the, the linkage yes. between appropriateness and... And, and the, effectiveness. Effective, uh, suitable, and they use all those words. I think Mr. Malik. Well, I think to sum it up, it is case sensitive. For that Absolutely. specific case. Just to sum it up. Case specific and sensitive. Yes, and, and situational. I think that's the word that is used in the EFF case. It's case perspective, just as used, and situational. So, so <laughs> she. she but the point I'm making is that she always has to do that because every case, just like in the court, will have its own peculiar circumstances. And uh, so she, her remedial action is unrestricted in that sense. Um, and then it says her invest. I just wanted to read the last sentence there, just to touch on the question of resources indirectly. Uh, it says, within the context of breathing life into the remedial powers of the public protector, she must have the resources and capacities necessary for effectively, to effectively execute her mandate so that she can indeed strengthen our constitutional democracy. So her first uh, uh, basis for taking this particular remedial action is has constitutional approval at least the question of resources just standing alone forget about conflict of interest and all that the the, the thing of, 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 of resources it's, itself is mentioned by the constitutional court as, as a tool uh, a necessary tool so on one basis could it be said that when she says i don't have resources as the constitutional court uh, has said that now suddenly that's an irrational basis that she has uh, dreamt up now, and then it says, her investigative powers are not supposed to bow down to anybody, not even at the door of the highest chambers of raw state power. The predicament, though, is that mere allegations and investigation of improper and co or corrupt conduct against all, especially powerful public office bearers, are generally bound to attract a very unfriendly re response. And then it goes on about how, how uh, you know, resistance naturally will, will, will follow from those who hold power. And then the last uh, uh, sentence there, if compliance with remedial action, I'm, I'm at 56 now, if compliance with remedial action taken were optional, then very few culprits, if any at all, would allow it to have any effect. So we're back to the question of effectiveness. So in, in, in short, the, 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 the restriction uh, the admitted restriction of her powers to select in this particular case are uh, fully, fully uh, justified. Um, well, it's not only justified, it is not the, the point that selection of the judge by the Chief Justice lends credibility to, and, and, and the public perception is that it, this is an independent, a truly independent appointment. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a very powerful and, and separate point which needs, really needs to be emphasized. That what is being vindicated here are the rights of the public uh, to have a credible process. Whether the president selects the most angelic of judges, uh, it doesn't matter. The point of the matter is not about the judge. This, uh, and there's some suggestion from our learned colleagues that we are suggesting that there are judges who are who are going to be good and others are going to be bad. That's, 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 that's not the point. Actually, it's the exact opposite point that needs to be emphasized. What they are doing is to impugn the credibility of the Chief Justice. Because the Chief Justice must be assumed that, it must be assumed that he will select any judge, and any judge can do this. But the point uh, which, which links to, to, to the point you are, you, you, you are, you are posing to me, Justice Parapet, is that uh, that selection must then vindicate the public's right, and the public must be able to say, and as I, as I said yesterday, even if that judge will exonerate uh, the president, in fact, even more importantly, if, if he's ex exonerated, then the public must say, yes, we are happy that he was not captured because uh, the, 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 the selection was made uh, above board and in accordance with the appropriate media election. Uh, now, I just want to make this point. 
also to emphasize that actually what, 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 what the public protector has proposed is not even normal in that sense. The, the power to select and the power to appoint are not inseparable. We have many examples by the president himself. We have many examples, and I'll just cite two. When the president uh, uh, appoints the board of ICASA or the SABC and so on, the power to select those people is uh, rest in parliament. That, that, that goes back to the question that the JP asked me, where I say there's no specific um, uh, authority that we found, but there are many live examples of where this happens. When that happens, the, the president uh, appoints the, the persons who, for various good reasons uh, uh, to do with public independence and all that, are then are selected by somebody else. Well, when the JSC, the Judicial Services Commission, <coughs> Uh, nominates uh, judges, the president appoints uh, that person. But in reality, the, the, the president is, is not, in other words, the, the, the powers to select and to appoint are not, it, it's not, there's nothing startling about the fact that those powers can be separated where there's, there's the good reason. As I say, whether the reason is judicial independence or it's the independence of SABC or ICASA or whatever. The, 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 our law is replete with examples where the power to appoint is uh, for, 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 for justifiable reasons uh, 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 separated. I think the section I want to read is section 177 and 178, the one that is with the JSC. And it makes it clear one of those subsections there maps out the whole process. Uh, there's interviews, this and that and that and that. But then the, the last the section says, then the president must appoint this and that and that person. Okay. Then, now, um, if we then go to the, the uh, if, if I may just be permitted to, to go back to the question of what, what I said yesterday was, what, what is the, the, the juridical nature of these so-called observations? Now, as, as, as lawyers, you know, we don't like these new, new terms, observations. <laughs> we want the terms that we know. And my, 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 my proposal is, 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 is simply this, my submission. That what, what the public protector calls observations are actually nothing else but prima facie evidence, or prima facie findings, or as we call them in our, in our uh, affidavit, preliminary findings. So, but it doesn't matter what you call them. You can call them observations, preliminary findings, the question is, what is the substance? It's not the form of the word that is used. The substance of, of, of what we have in front of us is and again, just to save time, I'll just make the references. The, the definitions, the, the legal definitions of um, prima facie proof and prima facie evidence we, uh, we can be found at page 130 <coughs> to 133 of Zephet. Zephet on evidence. And uh, I just want to make this point in addition. Uh, Zephyr at page 131 quotes a case of expert minister of justice and Jacobson where it was said prima facie evidence in its usual sense is used to mean prima facie proof of an issue the burden of proving uh, which is upon the party giving that evidence in the absence of further evidence from the other side the prima facie proof becomes conclusive proof and the party giving it discharges his bonus Obviously, this is made in the context of litigation, so one has to make the necessary adjustments. But the point really that is being made is that uh, once you have prima facie proof, as I said yesterday, it is something that is on a higher than allegations, not as high as conclusive proof, because that, that, that is the stage that, that follows. Which takes us to this point, very important. The, the public protector, makes the point repeatedly in her report about um, 
the failure of the president, when invited to do so, to rebut or comment even on the, on, the, on the evidence. Now, we know that as a general statement, again, and again, I'm not transplanting these principles. I'm simply uh, uh, using them to, to, to illustrate the point. The, at a page 134, 133 to 130, let's just say to 135 of Zephyr. He deals with what he calls failure to rebut or to explain. Now that's important in the context of prima facie evidence because sometimes the failure to rebut clear evidence. I mean, if I'm holding a gun and somebody, there's a dead body here and the gun is smoking and uh, somebody comes and says, did you kill the person? And I say nothing. So the prima facie proof can, in those kinds of circumstances, uh, graduate to conclusive proof merely because of the failure to deal with it uh, when, when confronted with it. Um, but this is what the commission will investigate uh, at the end of the day, whether the one by the president on his own or the one dictated to him. So, uh, no, 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 I, yes. I take that point. I accept yes. that point, Jackie. But I'm, I'm simply saying that here now, as we, as we stand, yeah. we have a situation where the public pro protector says at page 40 of, of, the, of her uh, report, mm. paragraph 3.14, and, and uh, just as an aside, the, 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 the chronology of this matter, as, as, as uh, the JP pointed out uh, in our discussion in chambers, the chronology of this matter must start on the 22nd of April in 2016. That is at the time at which, remember there was a letter in March which was not received, but on, on 22nd April, the letter is received. And it's very clear from the report that, that that letter contains an invitation to comment. It is in that context that she says at page 40, on 22 April I forwarded a copy of the letter, blah, 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 and then she says at 2.14, I received no response from the president. In other words, to, to that invitation. At page 41, she, she says, I ended off the notice by, this is now the notice of the 1st of October. 3.17. I ended off the notice by advising the president that, that if I do not get his version, which contradicts the said evidence, there would be a possibility that I could find that the above allegations are sustained by the evidence. I detailed the various conclusions that I will make in that case. In other words, she's now given an, a warning to say, look, if you fail to rebut this, then it might be elevated to something else. At page 44, I she think again you're, you're, you've laments. You've made your point, Mr. Bofo. Uh, you've made your point. Okay, uh, there's one. Okay, then I'll give you one out of three, at least. <laughs> if, uh, which, which is. Uh, okay, I'll just give the references. I won't read them. Page 44, paragraph 3.25. Uh, page 44 again, paragraph 3.26. Page 108, 108, paragraph 5.28. All those are, are instances where the, the public protector specifically explains what that basically. Um, the, the one in page 44, what paragraph is it? It's paragraph 3.35. Uh, right. Yes. And 3.36. Yes. And 2.36 on the same page. And Thank then you page 108, 5.28. Right. Okay. Um, and then a separate point of page. 85. No, okay. I, I, again, I just uh, I won't read the, the detail. I simply wanted to refer to um, heading five there, which says evidence and information obtained. So again, what we're dealing with evidence, albeit prima facie. Uh, I think you should move to your last point because you're running out of time. Uh, I was still on the same uh, deal as yesterday. Well, you allowed uh, Advocate Ngubai Tobi to use the chunk it's of your time. Yes. Uh, I won't do it again. That's <laughs> uh, <coughs> Oh, yes. Let, let, yes.
Yes, I'm, I'm going to move to the, the question of Before I move to the last one, let me just pose the, the problem as this. So in the ultimate uh, analysis, the question really facing the court is, in the light of the investigations, the prima facie findings, the failure and refusal to cooperate and to assist in breach of his duties, the very wide powers as defined by the Constitution, was the public protector uh, powerless to act or was her immediate action appropriate? Now, turning to the question, the last question, which is uh, the cost, I would like, with the pension of the court, to. We, we have taken the liberty to prepare a draft order, and I'll explain. Uh, it will either be useful or not useful. <laughs> but, uh, Thank you. We, we will give it to our learning Thank class. You. The, the, the point, as I said yesterday, is that uh, the no, normally as respondents we would just ask for order number one. Application is dismissed. That would be the normal order we would ask for. But with the greatest respect, given the wide powers of the court, we, we want to uh, add the, the, the relief that will really uh, vindicate and protect the rights of the public. And, um, but paragraph two is really just a, a rehash of the of the order that was given in, 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 in the Kanta case. And uh, paragraph three. The, the important ones are that number four, where we we'll say the public protector must be ordered to deliver uh, this order to the Chief Justice no later than five days of this order. The President to appoint within 15 days of this order a commission of inquiry headed by a judge solely selected by the Chief Justice, who shall provide one name to the President within five days after receipt of a copy of this order. And the President is further directed to comply with paragraph 8.7 and 8.8 of the Public Protector's Report, uh, in that the Commission is given powers of evidence of collection that are no less than that of the Public Protector. The President shall submit the Commission's report to Parliament within 14 days of its release. Such report being produced no later than 180 days from its inception that comes from the new direction. And then the last part, which is what I want to address now, is the president must pay the cost of this application in his personal capacity, including the cost occasioned by the employment of two counsel. So if we are with you, you want us to dictate to Chief Justice that he only has five days to select a judge? <laughs> no, we, we were very careful not to do that. Well, for that's, what, that's what this sounds like. Well, with the, the, that order then can, can, can... Well, I'm just saying if we're with you. That if, is. If, if you're with us. It's not so much a dictation if you think about it, uh, Judge President. Remember where we are. We are, I mean, we are literally almost on the anniversary of the, the order that you gave, uh, Judge President, uh, a year ago for this to happen. It should have happened. So every time you see 15 days or five days here, yeah, I think uh, November uh, 2016. So this matter really has, has, has uh, even if you take away the, the April, just look at it narrowly from November last year. The, everybody should have been ready, ready to, do, to, to do this. And the only reason that we, it was not done is because the president has um, uh, brought this review in the normal court, not even in the urgent court, as he did when he wanted to do we, we have a discretion as to how to fashion our order, don't yes. we? Yes. So if, you, uh, if you admit that, I don't think I want to hear you anymore. I do, I do. I do. Okay, thank you. And, and, uh, Can you go to the, to the costs part, yes. please? The, 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 the cost, well, if I may say just broadly about the other relief, yes. it's really motivated by the obvious urgency the importance of this matter and the unnecessary delays and, and so on. But uh, I won't delay at that point. I think that point was made sufficiently yesterday. The, as far as the costs are concerned... Um, the president is saying, I'm the president, constitutionally appointed, and I'm defending the power the constitution gives me to appoint. Why should I be hit with a personal cost order when I do that? I think that's um, the issue, isn't it? Yes, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it very squarely. Yes. Uh, Can just bear with me for one second? <coughs> as 
as far as the costs are concerned, uh, we said, well, the, 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 the president really has not dealt with the, with the, uh, the issues that were raised. And again, if, if, without repeating myself, this matter must be reviewed in the context of the aborted uh, urgent application to block this report. That's why these spe specific parties have been cited. But he brought he his has. review application within a month of, of that abortive attempt on his part. Yes, he, he, he did. But as, as I say, uh, in, in my respectful submission, a reasonable president would have uh, uh, reciprocated his bringing of that application similarly by bringing it on, a, on an urgent basis if he really was uh, if he genuinely was concerned about the powers of the public protector uh, not once again remember we're dealing with a, a, a historical situation here of a, a legendary abuse of court uh, uh, <coughs> systems and processes whether you are talking about Ganta, spy tapes, or this matter. We have a situation where the courts, with respect, are b being abused simply for nothing to be done, for matters which are of such great importance to the public. And we're going to have this merry-go-round forever. We'll have a judgment here, then there'll be another appeal, and another 10 years will elapse before uh, the commission is... is, is, is uh, so is your argument that the president is guilty of abusing the judicial process yes. in this litigation? It is. Then let me hear you. Yes. This is the, the argument. Mm -hmm. the, the, president, the president is A, as, as defined in, in the Gaza um, case, yes. the, 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 the embodiment of our constitution and, and values and so on and so on. The president has got duties under section 83 uh, to uphold, defend, and respect the constitution of the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Law of the Republic. The president has further uh, uh, obligations in terms of section 181 to assist, not, not to stand idle, but to assist the public protect, as do other members of the, of the, of the executive. The president has further powers in terms of or other obligations in terms of section 195, because the president is an organ of state, to ensure that there is no maladministration. The president has further powers under section 237 of the of the constitution to ensure that uh, matters of this kind are dealt with without delay. These are this is a cluster of powers and obligations that lie on the on the president, mm. and that's how we would fashion what the judge president in a different context yesterday called the reasonable president. <coughs> now, against all of that. We have a situation where the president comes to this court. He is asked a very simple, to do a very simple thing. To say, you are a suspect, or, or rather an implicated person. Let me put it more higher than that. You are an implicated person in this matter. Uh, you are aware of the resource constraints because they were addressed to you. And all that is needed is for you to agree that uh, the ch Chief Justice, no less than the Chief Justice of the country, must uh, select a judge and you must appoint him. And that is done carefully. The, the, the public protector mentioned section 84.2 in the, in the course of that. She says, I know you have the, the power to appoint, and therefore you retain that power to appoint. And yet, what do we have? A reasonable president in those circumstances would say, this is the most important matter. I'm innocent of these charges, uh, and le let it be investigated as soon as possible. What does the president do? He even says it in his, uh, in his affidavit. He says one of the reasons he brought this application was to clarify the powers. And who's the, the country is burning 
<coughs> we don't have time to get the legal opinions from courts and clarify this, that, or the other. The point of the matter is that a reasonable president in those circumstances would not have taken uh, this, uh, would not employ these dilatory uh, tactics. Number one, if indeed genuinely he really wanted to to uh, to test uh, the powers, I, I, as I said, he would have done so uh, with the agency that the matter deserves. And uh, even that, the so-called application would have been brought on an urgent basis. No, no court, and at least no respondent, would have uh, contested the fact that this was a matter of national importance, of extreme urgency, rather than wasting another another decade with uh, delaying tactics. So that's the that's the first the first issue. But with the greatest respect, and I don't want to go back to the merits. But what, what really, really is, uh, is facing us here is a situation, let, let's just take one example from the report. If indeed, just to show the, the seriousness of what, what is being uh, the alleged against the president, if it is true that the Guptas knew about a cabinet reshuffle or the appointment of a finance minister, a week at least or more before that happened. Then there's only one person in the whole world who could have told them that. And it is the president, because it is his sole uh, uh, power and uh, it resides only with him. So whatever you th one might say about the, 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 the quality of the evidence that is there, the, the nature of the investigation, but it postulates basically politically and constitutionally the end of the world. Because at the point at which a, a private entity that has a, a business interest that, is, uh, that in, involves the president's son and his admitted friends start to appoint cabinet ministers, <coughs> then we must, know, we must kiss the democracy goodbye. So we're not dealing with some administrative, uh, maladministration here, actually. Uh, you know, of uh, somebody who didn't get a house, uh, where they jumped the queue, and so on and so on. No. This is, this is it. Once a, a, a president can connive with his friends and his son to ensure to appoint cabinet ministers, a power that is denied even from, from cabinet ministers, Cabinet ministers cannot play any role Are you still in, arguing in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the appointment. Mm. Yes, uh, the, the point here I'm making simply, yes. uh, 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 Judge President, yes. is that the, 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 the allegations, whatever you think, even let's even leave them at the level of allegations, nothing more, are of such a nature that a reasonable president would have uh, uh, cooperated to make sure a, not to bring such a frivolous application, but if you do, then to do it with the sensitivity of, of. and then, then with the greatest respect. And this is why we say, firstly, the, the, the costs must be on a punitive scale, whether they're personal or not personal, but they should be on a punitive scale. Then you come here, uh, apart from all the, 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 the games that were played with the, with the uh, public protector, even, even here in the, in the affidavit, you find what really I will call uh, abuse of court, ab misleading the court. Let's take one example. My learned friend, Mr. Smeni, I'm sure acting on his instructions, says uh, to us yesterday, the, the president, and again, I'm not revisiting the, the merits and the question of corruption and so on, but he says, the, when the president said on the 22nd of June, I'm about to, about to, those are his words. I'm about to appoint a commission of inquiry. He didn't, he didn't mean this commission of inquiry of the, of the uh, public protector. But that is absurd because in the same breath, he says the president knew that you cannot appoint another commission. You can't appoint the, the, the other commission why? Because you'll be brought to court, 
uh, and so on. So clearly, therefore, what he was talking about on the 22nd of June can only be this commission. It could not be the one that he says would be, would be challenged. I mean, those are clear, blatant gymnastics that are being played even to, to, the, to, 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 to this court, forget about the public, to avoid a simple matter of uh, investigating and, uh, and, and, and uh, I'm sorry, investigating and, and, and really getting on with uh, 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 the, the public knowing whether or not the, the, there is uh, criminality at the highest levels of, of, of government, which is an important thing. And at, at the heart of this case, uh, 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 Justice uh, uh, JP and, and, and uh, uh, Justices, is an attempt uh, uh, very uh, uh, thinly veiled to, to preserve the so-called prerogative of the president, which I, I spoke about yesterday. In other words, the whole case is built on the notion that simply because the president has got exclusive powers to appoint commissions, therefore it means he can do what he likes. Or, to put it the other way, nobody can uh, tell him how to do it, even when he is the, 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 the person who is uh, um, implicated. So he must pers personally and exclusively choose the judge. Uh, he does not want the Chief Justice to do it. If he's acting in the public interest, he wouldn't uh, resist the, the involvement of the Chief Justice. No, 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 no sane person uh, can do that. Because the, that office, by its definition, I mean, uh, uh, Judge President, I don't want to waste time, but uh, let, let's just take a simple example. If somebody came to this court here, the Gauteng High Court, and said, Judge Mlamo did this and the other judge president and uh, took this file and that and, and so on. It, it, it's almost natural that the, the judge president of this division would know that, well, for this particular case, because there are these uh, silly allegations that have been made, I'm not going to do what I normally do, which is to select uh, the judges that are going to sit in that particular case. It's, it's, it's a natural reaction of anybody who really, A, wants uh, uh, the, the, the country to move forward or the allegations to be, to, to be cleared. All of us, one can have a thousand examples about uh, how that happens. It happens in board meetings on a daily basis when people uh, perceive even a risk of, as, as I said yesterday, of a conflict of interest. Why do we have somebody where there's a clear, there is no one else. All the complaints are about one person. They are about uh, the president of the country. All the complaints, the first person to be interviewed is the president. The, the, he, his, his person looms large in this matter. And this is the last point I want to make on, on, on personal costs. Mr. Semenya says, no, he's acting in his official capacity. Well, that, with the greatest respect, must be rejected with the contempt it deserves. Because the suggestion that when President Zuma was uh, calling uh, Mr. Masako to say, uh, that he was doing so in his official capacity is absurd and must be rejected. The suggestion that when he uh, was saying to Ms. Fei Chi uh, or rather when he was present, uh, at least allegedly, when, when she was being offered a position, when Mkabisi joined us and so on, all of which have not been refuted, by the way, uh, all those allegations, that that was being done. In other words, the, the allegations of corrupt activities, corrupt criminal activities. Yeah, I, I think what you're doing is, Advocate Semenya's submissions were based on the presidential powers that he is here to vindicate. You are saying, because of the personal, alleged personal involvement of the president, that bringing this whole litigation should not have happened. Yes, uh, yes I'm saying that, but I'm also saying it was to protect his own personal skin. It, it has got nothing to do with the office of the president really, this whole thing. The, the, the whole, all these gymnastics and delaying tactics are to protect his own personal involvement or non-involvement, we don't know. 
But the point of the matter is that he, the, the, this is something, these are things that were done uh, in, in a criminal capacity, not in an official capacity. Uh, and, and, and that the, 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 the allegations by that nature. And again, I, I don't want to suggest that they are proven or anything. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm simply saying a reasonable president faced with these allegations about him himself uh, would either say, look, I can I cannot be, because really what you, what, what do we have here just we have a situation where the allegations are that the public has been stolen that, that money has been stolen from the public in the greatest uh, scheme. When we talk about these uh, parastatals that are involved here, five of them, I did an unscientific desktop uh, uh, research. They employ more than a hundred thousand people just between them. Transnet, SCOM, SABC, Daniel, um, I forget the fifth one. The public service per se employs a million people. So the, this thing touches all South Africans, and it's about taxpayers' money. Why must the taxpayers' money be stolen by the quotas with the president's connivance and pay for it? And the, the taxpayer must also pay for the legal costs of, uh, of, 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 of resisting an investigation into that very fact. Please. We, we cannot, if, if public officials are allowed to continue like this, then these courts are going to be uh, inundated with uh, uh, frivolous applications, delaying tactics. I can swear that nobody would have taken this. If he was paying from his own pocket, he wouldn't have brought such a, a matter in front of, the, of, of this court. It's because we are paying for it. Yeah, could I ask you to wind up, please? Yes. Um, then uh, the, 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 the question of, 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 of frivolity, uh, which was raised by Mr. Semenya, with respect, does not really deal with the question of personal cost. It deals with my second point, which is that the cost, in any event, if the court is not with me as to the question of personal cost, I would uh, respectfully submit, without repeating the submissions that I've made, that nevertheless, even if the president is allowed, so to speak, to act in his official capacity, the, because of what I've already said, the cost should nevertheless be on a punitive scale. And I associate myself with the other submissions uh, to do with um, uh, the biowatch application, if, 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 if the reverse works. If you do, if you do. If, if, if I may just. Uh, <coughs> and and, and the, just a passing shot, uh, uh, Judge President, is to say that I'm, I'm assuming again, once again, that. One doesn't have to reproverse uh, the facts, as the JP uh, said yesterday. But the motivation, even on the question of cost, the, the, the whole question of the conduct, the refusal to cooperate and so on, is all on the record. I don't have to go back. You're getting again. your head. But I'd like it to be taken into, into account in this context, simply in this context of the cost debate. As God Thank is, you very unless much. Unless there's anything else. Thank you very much, Advocate Bolton. As it is. Yeah. Uh, Advocate Badlander. Mm -hmm. Advocate Badlander, the ground you wish to traverse has been traversed has already. Been. So you are on borrowed time. Judge President, look, we've listened very carefully to the submissions that have been made, and we don't propose to, submit, to repeat any of them. Okay. The points that we make will complement the points that have already been addressed. Right. If I were to seek to do so, under three headings, right. uh, briefly. And I, I will only take the court to authorities that have not already been dealt with, okay. or points that have not already been dealt with. Okay. Judge President, members of the court, we propose to address three questions. Firstly, and very briefly, whether the power to take appropriate remedial action depends on their first being a final finding of unlawful conduct. Secondly, the separation of powers issue, which has not been addressed in as much detail, that is, does the mere fact that the public protector gave remedial action which implicated section 84.2F of the Constitution, does that reach separation of powers and make her decision impermissible? And thirdly, whether the directed to appoint a commission can be regarded as appropriate remedial action, which we submit certainly can. Can I repeat that for me? Does? Whether the decision of the public protector to require the appointment of a commission 
can that be regarded as appropriate remedial action? And we submit that it certainly can. So those are the three points that we wish to address, mainly from a legal point of view in light of the points made. That's the proceedings in the High Court, of course. We will go back there live in a short while, but uh, let's go back to the top of the hour and uh, let us remind you of your top stories here on the newsroom. I'm Elvis Preslin. I'm Kendall Mahamad. And of course, as you know, it's a big day for the Finance Minister, Malusi Gagaba, that will be presenting the mini-budget today. We'll also be live at the State Capture Review case, which is currently underway in the High Court in Pretoria. And the Police Minister, Fakil Mbalula, admits that loopholes in the police force contributed to the increase in murder and armed robberies in the national crime statistics. Those are your headlines there in the news, but before we get there, let's yeah. find out from Kendall what's happening on the sports front. Quite a lot happening in the world of sports. A good day to you. Basically, we're going to be talking quite a bit about all of this and more. 33 old Dolphins all around the rugby flank. Yeah, he's planned to make the yeah. most of his surprise call up to the T20 side to play Bangladesh. Of course, they will be playing again shortly after uh, literally uh, doing a series right watching the ODIs. We haven't won anything yet, as yet. And obviously I've experienced and I've tasted what it's like to get all the way there and lose it. And you don't want that. And season campaign Eric Tinkler offers some sage words of advice to his team ahead of the CAF Confederations Cup final against defending champions TP Mazembe. <laughs> and Venus Williams beats Latvian Yelena Ostapenko in three epic hours to keep her hopes of qualifying for the WTA semi-finals alive. And that's it, that's what we have for you in the sports. But Elvis, that's all up to you. Thank you, Kendall. Now, the Finance Minister, Malusi Gigaba, Gigaba rather, it's a big day. He will deliver his first midterm budget policy statement today. Now, the mini-budget, as you know, does not provide exact allocations, but it does set out government spending priorities for the next three years. Ratings agencies will be paying close attention to the minister's speech. South Africa has already been downgraded to junk status and they've warned government that they want to see policy that supports fiscal strength and stability. Today's speech is expected to give direction on plans to deal with declining revenues and dysfunctional state-owned enterprises. Now, we want to see if we can uh, connect with Devon Murrigan, who is in Cape Town a little bit later, to give us an update on the midterm budget. Uh, so as soon as we do get hold of him, we'll get to that. Now, for more updates on the story on the midterm budget, our reporter Devon Murrigan is now standing by at Parliament, and uh, he earlier joined us with more analysis from Cape Town ahead of the budget this afternoon. Well, we're approaching uh, mid-morning here in Cape Town at Parliament. The drizzle continues ahead of that all-important midterm budget policy statement from uh, the newly installed Finance Minister, Malusi Gigaba. It is his inaugural budget statement, and many argue that this might be a watershed moment a lot of issues on the table here. We have a weakening economy, uh, growth expected around half a percent. That's not enough to create the jobs needed. Big question mark over funding of SOEs and of course this widening budget deficit. That's the difference between the money we collect in taxes and that which we spend. Now, perhaps that's uh, a good point to bring in our expert here, Afzal Khan from Raft Incorporated. I, I want to talk about taxes specifically, uh, Afzal, because it's perhaps the closest reference point to the man on the street out there. In order to uh, plug this deficit that we are seeing, some put it at 30, some put it at 60 billion rand, depending on who's doing the calculations. And it seems, though, that we've got to turn to the taxpayer for this. 
So for the mini budget, there's not much one can do now because you're in the middle of the cycle. So you can estimate the number and plan for it. So they're going to have to come up with something in, in the borrowing space for that. Uh, they might allude to taxes. The only thing you could do with interim taxes is your once-off taxes, so donations tax, capital gains tax. But I, I can't see him doing anything now in relation to that. Um, he, he might allude to something, but you know what's coming up in December, so so they're probably going to be quiet around that and talk about what's going to happen. The problem with, with, with the collection is if SARS goes tight on taxpayers to collect, which is what we're seeing in the market, you, you they might collect the revenue, but they might cripple the economy. So that balancing act is, is very important that the economy is protected. Okay. But nevertheless, certainly this, as you correctly say, is an adjustment budget. It reviews what had happened over the past six months and three Three years ahead, but arguably this is a curtain raiser for things to come in February. Um, and you can do one of many things. I mean, you could uh, cut spending, you could borrow, and when it comes to taxes, either introduce new taxes, uh, expand the tax base, or, or, or increase the efficiency. So, based on that, I mean, if we had to look forward to February, does the consumer and the average business need to be wary of what's coming in in, in February? So, so the various committees that have been giving guidance have spoken about a wealth tax in the beginning of the year. There was also talk about a wealth tax. The form of that wealth tax is, I think, what people are, are, are looking at. Um, to introduce a completely new tax is incredibly cumbersome. So what you might find, uh, donations tax, the rate might change from 20% to something else. Um, skills development levy is 0.5%. That could change. VAT, they might talk that now is the time where they don't have a choice. In tough times, people need to come together. But I think the man on the street is going to say, what about government spending? Um, so I think from a tax perspective, they do need to pull off the pedal. Remember, personal taxes went up to 45% in February for the maximum threshold. You can't take it much higher than that without starting to, to cripple the, the middle class and cripple the, the tax-paying public. When you talk about the contribution that taxes across the board can make to plug this particular deficit, um, it doesn't seem convincing that that's enough money to plug it. Uh, so, so the question is then, should we perhaps see a mix of borrowing and taxing and spending cuts, as you say? What do you foresee? So, so in a sense, it's easy that first you look for borrowing. If you can't get borrowing, then you're almost forced to tax because it's an accountant's job again. You have to balance the books. So if you're balancing the books and you can't borrow or the debt is too expensive because of our, our, our status, then you have to tax. And then it's a, 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 a reality for everyone out there that the, the country then needs to come together and, and help to pay the taxes. So there's a big big pressure is going to be on government to show that they can actually do the job so the taxpayers are willing to pay. Because remember, the willingness to pay tax is another huge issue. Yeah. And that's a very important aspect. I mean, you have a thing called tax morality is the term I think uh, the finance minister used. Uh, we had this phenomenon that was identified in the US where you tax uh, in order to increase your revenue to such an extent that you actually create the opposite effect and people hold back or find it unwilling to get involved in economic activity because it's just not worth it. If you look at the fact that we had this 28 billion rand in tax measures in February, six months down the line, our fiscus is still in a bad shape. Are we reaching that point where, you know, we've reached the ceiling in terms of tax measures? So, so that's right. And it's not just tax. It's the, the red tape around being uh, in the formal sector or even being an SME. Uh, it's not just tax. You, you've got to register a company. There's SIPSI requirements. There are all of these requirements that, that, that are barriers to entry. So if I want to start a business, uh, there's so many barriers that, you know, do I really want to start a business? And you're 100% you're right. That are we at that threshold that if we start to tax too much, people say well you know what I'm not going to start a business and that's going to be our problem because the solution for our country is going to come from the SME sector it's not going to come from the formal sector uh, perhaps mining taxes may be something they, they'll look at but that solution has to come from that sector and you have to incentivize um, and create an awareness of the incentives there's a lot in there but the man in the street the, the employment tax incentive if you go to the, 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 the small businessman and you say have you claimed your ETI he'll ask you what's that 
I don't know what it is. So, so these things need to be simpler and more easily accessible to the businessmen out there, especially right. the small businessmen. And my final question for the Finance Minister Malusi Gigaba this afternoon, to convey a sense of credibility and believability uh, and acceptance uh, with all the broad players in the tax base. What do you think is the single most important thing he needs to convey this afternoon? I think transparency is probably the most important thing, is that if we are short on budget, then this is what we're short by. Um, we're not going to withhold VAT refunds. We're going to pay out VAT refunds because while we're short as government, the economy must run. We don't want to cripple business by keeping your cash flow with SARS. There are problems in paying out VAT refunds and many other refunds. And what National Treasury need to do and SARS is to make sure that your refund is paid out on time and then say, we're doing all of this, we're protecting the economy, but this is what we're short by and these are our plans to fix that gap. And it can't be a short-term plan. This has to be long-term thinking. Thanks very much, Absal Khan from uh, Raft Incorporated. Thanks indeed for your time. And that's where we'll leave it. More coverage of this inaugural midterm budget by the Finance Minister, Malusi Gigaba, coming up as the day progresses. tackles constitutional issues. When South Africa became a constitutional democracy, we had a fairly sound legal system in place requiring the constitution to guide the direction in which it must go and the way in which it must be refashioned. The Justice Ministry, the custodian of human rights. We actually uh, have a, a plan to come up with a comprehensive uh, review um, of our human rights instrument. Advocate dealing with evidence. Sometimes you have to use a crook to catch a crook. So mm. we expected that the uh, credibility would really be taken to task. You try and consult your witnesses and prepare them as best as you can. Hashtag rights with Dubi Lamates on legal issues every Sunday at 2 o'clock Central African time. Um, policy statement. It's all happening this afternoon. Let's now go live back to our reporter, Devon Murrigan, who is uh, in Cape Town to give us more. Once again, good morning to you, Devon. Well, thanks very much indeed, Elvis. We're approaching uh, midday. It's mid-morning now here at Parliament, waiting for the inaugural budget policy statement speech by Malusi Gigaba, the recently installed uh, finance minister. Uh, of course, he's got a, a big task ahead of him. Uh, remember that he's uh, delivering this uh, medium-term budget policy statement under the backdrop of really a solid track record from his predecessors. Here you have an institution that has ranked up a reputable reputation or good reputation internationally the Treasury for its predictability for its transparency so under that backdrop Malusi Gigaba now goes ahead and uh, uh, delivers this medium-term budget policy statement two big things one is that he's got to reflect a certain sense of credibility in this budget statement and the other thing is he's got to actually assure uh, all the economic stakeholders that we are on the right fiscal path and part of that fiscal part is sticking uh, within the financial uh, guidelines of, uh, of good financial management. Well, let's just try and find out exactly how he could be doing uh, this afternoon. Tabi Lioka is from Argon Asset Management. Tabi, thanks indeed for joining us. The budget deficit um, is perhaps the biggest cloud hovering around this budget. We have to find money to plug that gap. Uh, what do you think we'll hear today in that regard? 
Yeah, I mean, um, analysts expect about a 40 to 50 billion rand shortfall. And obviously, the minister has to then speak to that and see how we can actually close this deficit. Um, we expect about a 4% uh, budget deficit. That's about 10% um, of uh, South Africa's GDP. So it's quite significant. And um, there are various ways of closing it. There's nothing wrong with the expenditure side of GDP. Actually, expenditure uh, has been quite muted. It's a revenue that is a problem. So when there's slow GDP growth, it's very difficult for the government to then uh, increase um, uh, revenues when you know the, the economy is underperforming. So the sluggish growth is a problem. Another th issue then is also uh, things like the SOEs have that have been a problem too for government. Um, government has paid um, quite a bit of money into SAA, and I know that the spotlight has been on SAA, but there are other SOEs that are also um, underperforming and may need funding such as PRASA, SABC, etc. Um, and so those are also a concern. It will be interesting to see what the minister says to that. The other thing is that there is the wage bill um, uh, that is growing. The wage bill is about 40% of non-interest expenditure. So it's quite significant. I think that is about 12% of GDP. Uh, the, uh, the wage negotiations have started and um, next year we'll hear the outcome of the wage negotiations. The government has expects about a 7% increase. At least that's what the, that was budgeted for. And uh, But the trade unions, the public sector trade unions, are calling for a 10 to 12%. So it's quite significantly higher than what budget um, the government is expecting. And obviously that could compromise the budget. The other thing also is that in July, during the policy conference, um, the ANC mentioned uh, a commitment to uh, the NHI and also to um, uh, not increasing, at least free education, free tertiary education for low and middle income earners. And again, looking at the budget, that was not uh, um, looked at uh, according to, or at least in relation to the fiscus. And something like the NHS is going to be, NHI sorry, is going to be very expensive for the government. Uh, currently, uh, if we look at 2015 numbers, um, pay as in uh, uh, fees that uh, students pay to universities account for about 34% um, of university total income and that basically will be uh, something that the government will have to fork out. All of those pressures on our fiscus this afternoon uh, but I want to go back to what you said about state-owned enterprises with regards to SAA something like 10 billion rand needed to get this airline back on track um, We've heard the issue of, of telecom shares coming in. There was a possibility that government would sell off these shares and use that money to, to, to rescue SAA. Uh, we subsequently heard that might not happen. But something really needs to be sold as far as government assets is concerned because where the money would come from still remains a mystery. That is true. Um, the assumption is that they actually took the money from the National Revenue Fund. But again, that money needs to come from somewhere else. Um, so it, it, that is also something that the minister will have to iron out at the um, NTBPS in his, in his speech so that we can also get clarity on where the money will come from. And um, you are right that they did cancel the selling of shares um, uh, from Vodacom. And these are, you know, good performing or performing uh, shares that contribute significantly towards the fiscus uh, from a dividends perspective. I think 800 million goes into the fiscus. So it's not money that we can actually just uh, take easily and put into an ESCOM. I think we also need to have very uh, look at alternative ways of solving uh, um, SAA's problem. And one such way which has not been very popular is privatization. And um, privatization was hinted at at the budget in February, uh, but we'll see, we'll see what the minister says about that. There's been a lot of opposition to actually using the big P word, which is privatization for SAA, but there was one suggestion that said, well, perhaps can we not go the African bank route, perhaps split SAA into a well-functioning airline and a bad one, and then perhaps take that approach. Is that a possibility? Could be a possibility, but the problem is that it's, it, it's, it's for, for many years now, it has been underperforming, so we don't really have a solution. Uh, uh, we haven't had a solution. The the other thing is that there are suggestions that who is SAA serving? So you're taking public funds and 
and this is the public that many of them, those who don't actually use SAA because they cannot afford to fly um, in, in South Africa or elsewhere using SAA. So it's also one of those that can be debated in. You no, know, it is serving a very small population in the country. Yes, obviously, if it was performing well, we would have a different argument. Uh, it would be generating revenues and will be contributing to the economy, but it's not. It's actually deducting, and it's deducting and being utilized by only a very small uh, minority. So would you rather have that money go elsewhere, either in free education or helping people get out of poverty? We already learned that uh, you know South Africans are poorer now than they were a few years ago. So there are other issues and other debates and arguments for utilizing that money and using it efficiently versus putting it in the dark hole that is um, SAA. And finally, Tabi, this big word confidence, I mean, is so much related to trust uh, in our government. Um, we've seen business confidence levels, I think, reach 33-year lows this year. No confidence means no investment, meaning less economic activity and less jobs. Um, is there anything that the finance minister can say this afternoon that might, just might, boost a little bit of confidence and get investors to start plowing in more money here? Because at the end of the day, it's a credibility issue as well, isn't it? That's very true. I think his commitment to uh, the fiscal consolidation is one um, you know lowering the spending ceiling further it's going to be very difficult especially at a time when there is electioneering happening you typically the government spends more during this period and obviously the wage bill will also compromise the expenditure While local, small and medium enterprises have many wishes for the upcoming medium-term budget policy statement or the mini-budget, now that will improve the ease of doing business. None of these will be significant unless the ultimate outcome of the speech is improved and it improves economic prospects. Now, for more on this, we're joined by Ben Beerman. He's the Managing Director at Business Partners Limited. A very good morning to you, sir, and welcome. Good morning, Elvis. As um, business partners, what is your expectations from the mini budget this afternoon? Others, we, we try and look at it from a small business perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's fair to say that in the current context, in the current narrative, what we would be wishing for is a rising tide because a rising tide would lift all boats. So mm -hmm. SMEs are a very unique and a special part of our economic mm -hmm. environment. And one would, be able, one would hope to be able to actually express wishes for that sector specifically. But I think it's dominated by the broader expectations around getting clear direction around economic growth, mm -hmm. to get some policy certainty and policy um, mm -hmm. clarity for every one of the big players within the economy. Mm -hmm. And if one then drills down into the small and medium enterprise sector, I think that would benefit mm -hmm. the, the broader sector as a, as a first step. But then also we always look at the ecosystem which small businesses need to, to thrive in, to, to, be, to be healthy and to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And then one would, could only wish for some initiatives that would improve that ecosystem, perhaps more funding, perhaps a big, bigger allocation to the small business ministry mm -hmm. that could actually do significant, take significant steps to try and improve that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Why is policy certainty, especially for small and medium enterprises, so important? Alice, you need to recognize that the, the bigger players within the broader economic environment, like the big corporates, the mining sector, the, the government, they are an important supplier or a customer base for SMEs because mm -hmm. most SMEs either supply to consumers or they supply to the, to the bigger corporates. Mm -hmm. And if those corporates are not procuring and those poor corporates are not growing, it then filters down to the SME sector. Mm -hmm. and that's why that big important issue this afternoon of getting policy certainty and clarity on our econ economic growth trajectory mm -hmm. would ultimately spin, spin down and roll down into the SME sector as well. But they're dependent on those sectors doing well as mm -hmm. well. What type of economic policies do you think will make South Africa a more investor-friendly country? That's e especially for SMEs, of course. Yes, I think the, 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 the first thing is that we need to get the, what I refer to as the confidence deficit addressed. Mm -hmm. Confidence is such an intangible confidence and trust it's such an intangible ingredient and it can so easily be rectified or improved mm -hmm. and if we can get that done this afternoon or we'll move forward to create more confidence and trust in where we're going mm -hmm. then I think that's the first step mm -hmm. in, in terms of getting our economic potential unlocked because we as a country I think we should be growing at three and a half to four percent mm -hmm. we have the potential to grow even at, at higher rates and we just not seem able to to unlock this growth and if our finance minister this afternoon mm -hmm. starts embarking on an inclusive growth 
policy statement, I think that will inspire confidence. If there's clear direction, clear decision making, and that we, that we remove the elephants in the room to a large extent about where he as, as the finance minister positions himself, it's such a vital role for our Mm -hmm. Our economy. A big word within the small medium enterprises segment is always about red tape. What red tape uh, do you think is hampering the growth of small business in this country? I think some of the red tape is necessary. We've, mm -hmm. we've got to recognize that we've, we have, we've got a well regulated economic environment and we've got really good principles and policies about how you. You, you operate within the business environment. Mm -hmm. And the thing that we argue the most for is to make sure that these rules and regulations and the red tape, if you, if you, mm -hmm. if you may, that, it's get <coughs> that it gets executed effectively. I think that is even more crucial than trying to remove some of the red tape. But there are lots of issues in terms of local government legislation that contradicts national government legislation. And that just makes it that much more difficult. Mm. for the SME to navigate the legal and, and, and compliance environment successfully. Mm -hmm. It adds a burden to the business, but I think we have to recognize as well that government has done some work and has mm -hmm. done some really good work in actually removing some of the red tape. And I think one example would be the one-stop shop that they've created at SARS, and I think we still have a brilliant world-class mm -hmm. revenue service. So one also needs to recognize the gains that they've made. Is funding still a stumbling block, block especially from um, the big four banks? And, and as business partners, what do you do to compensate and make sure that small and medium businesses has got access to it? We've got a fantastic fin financial sector um, in South Africa, well developed, well governed. But I think mm -hmm. it's again about risk. It's about trying to identify the risk and it's about confidence. And if those ingredients are in short supply or an increased supply of risk, then funders such as banks tend to become a bit more cautious because they can't see the future, they can't see where exactly the economic environment is going. So access to funding and be successful as a small business mm -hmm. to obtain funding will always remain a risk. Mm -hmm. It's got a number of factors that actually makes it more difficult, but our role as, as business partners is to actually identify the viability within the business rather than do lending on a, on a collateralized basis. Mm -hmm. And today, I think SMEs need funding more than ever to restructure their balance sheets, to embark on those growth plans that they might have. Mm -hmm. But in our experience, we've seen that a lot of SMEs have got very clearly defined and identified growth plans. But there's a reticence to actually embark on them. And again, it comes back to that vital ingredient of confidence in the future to take the plunge and to take the risk and actually grow your business. Mm -hmm. What agenda and direction do you think should National Treasury take in, in terms of the current macroeconomic challenges faced by the SME sector? I don't envy our finance minister because I think he has to walk such a tightrope this afternoon and I think even in March or February next year. Mm -hmm. because there's a number of factors that are constraining the amount of maneuverability that he has to come up with a clear and cohesive plan. Mm -hmm. If I was him, I would focus entirely on trying to get confidence and, and, and trust back. I've been saying this the whole time, mm -hmm. because within that, I think that will unlock a lot of positivity, give him a bit more capacity in terms of revenue growth, mm -hmm. and then really look at the efficiency in terms of the expenditure side of his, of his budget. Tax breaks and tax reliefs, is that perhaps on the card, do you think? I don't think so. I mm -hmm. think at this stage, I think I would be shocked if there was tax breaks announced mm -hmm. this afternoon. I think one understands the difficult position that he finds himself under with the revenues that are really seriously under, mm -hmm. under pressure. And I think the way to unlock additional revenue would, get, would be to get the economic environment growing. But I think at this stage, mm -hmm. I would not be surprised to see additional wealth taxes. Mm -hmm. I think in the current context and the current narrative, my view is that that would be justified. But I don't think that tax mm -hmm. breaks are in the mm -hmm. on the cards for the next 18 or 24 months. From the small, medium enterprise segment, your message to the minister this afternoon, what should he focus on? Minister, please give us a, pl a clear indication of where you stand in terms of your economic plan and make sure that we can get our economy's potential unlocked mm -hmm. by having clarity and having good policies to get this engine going because that will give us the inclusive growth that we so desperately need in this country. Mr. Birman, I thank you so much for your time and joining us. Thank you very much. That was Ben Birman. He's the Managing Director at Business Partners Limited.
The Law Society has slammed notices sent to four universities to jack up standards or risk losing their LLB courses. The Council on Higher Education issued a stern warning to the universities to conform within six months. I think it will affect the university. I think uh, um, outside, the, outside the law faculty there's a funding issue. It's been 112 years since Enoch Sontonga died as a relatively unknown composer, choir master and teacher. But today his legacy lives on through his greatest composition, Ngosi Sigeleli Africa. For all your news updates, stay tuned to Your World from Monday to Sunday. Welcome back. Uh, time for a little bit of sports with me, Kendall Makhamate. Now, FIFRO, the international organization that represents the interests of some 65,000 footballers worldwide, has released the findings of a study that shows that athletes who suffer concussion during their careers are more likely to report anxiety, depression, and sleep disturbance after they retire. Surveying over 500 former soccer, ice hockey, and rugby players from France, Finland, Ireland, South Africa, Spain, amongst other countries, the study was conducted by sports medicine experts from the University of Cape Town, St. Mariana University School of Medicine in Kawasaki, Japan, and Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow, Scotland. I spoke to one of the key researchers, Professor Mike Lambert from the University of Cape Town's Exercise Sciences and Sports Medicine Departments, and this is what he had to say. Well, the study is actually led by um, Vincent Gauterbach from Holland. And the reason that, that that's important is because he was an ex-professional football player. He played professional football for France for a number of years. And then he became a sports scientist. So he's got this interest in head injuries from a player's perspective. And now he's looking at it from another direction, that from a, a scientist's perspective. And he noticed when he was a player that many of the retired players seemed to show symptoms of distress. So that was really the catalyst for us doing the study. And he's now led several similar sorts of studies around the world, looking at different types of sports people and trying to make the link between professional sport and life after playing professional sport. Now, we know that um, many professional sports persons participating in contact sports do get concussions as it's almost accepted as being part of the job. But he, we were interested in seeing what are the consequences of a player who's had several concussions throughout their career. So we, we surveyed a group of uh, ex-professional players from a number of different sports, football, ice hockey, and, and rugby in this particular study. And we asked them a series of questions which all linked to their uh, what's called common mental disorders. And those are symptoms of distress, anxiety, um, sleeping disorders, and substance or alcohol abuse. So those were, those were the common symptoms of mental disorders that we really focused on. And uh, the first point was to find out just how many concussions the players had sustained during their careers. And we were surprised that nearly 30% of the players had got four concussions or more during their careers. And what surprised us even more was that those players who had had four concussions or more had an increased risk of getting these common mental disorders that, that I've described. So there, there's a, a clear association now between getting head injuries um, you know, spread out over a career and subsequent common mental disorders as a retired older older player. Professor, can you t uh, let's just jump right into the nub of it as well. Can you tell us uh, what kind of mental disorders are we talking about? Because I, I, I do know that uh, anxiety and, and depression is something that, that crops up right about this time of the year, for example, for a lot of people. Uh, are those the kind of illnesses mm. we're talking about? What about um, uh, maybe even um, uh, domestic violence and so on and so forth? Uh, what, what have you found? Well, the common mental disorders that we looked at really are the ones that common society experiences as well. So these are the, the mental states that detract from having a, a good, uh, fulfilling life and you know, cause disturbances. They might manifest as uh, family abuse or, or you know, domestic violence. 
it can manifest as, as in a number of different ways. You know, it's individualistic. It depends on the person how it actually manifests. But it certainly, I think the common thread is that it detracts from um, a good, wholesome, happy, fulfilling life. Right. Now, um, one of the things that, uh, that came up uh, on immediately hearing about this, this study, Professor, was uh, me remembering um, the research that was done in the States. Uh, I'm talking specifically of CTE uh, and how uh, National Football League players were finding, finding themselves uh, suffering uh, from different, uh, different mental disorders after their playing careers, uh, from as young as like mm -hmm. high school and college and, and professional footballers, as well as boxers as well. Um, is there some kind yes. of a link that can be found between your study and your research as well as what was done in the States? Yes, I think there is. Um, you know, our study was looking at specific diagnoses of concussion, and usually the traditional diagnosis is that the player you know, loses consciousness and then um, there's a short-term loss of memory. You know, that would be a classical case of concussion. But more modern definitions suggest that you don't have to lose consciousness at all. So any head injury would be regarded as a concussive injury. Now, CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is a condition which develops after repetitive head injuries. So they don't have to be serious head injuries. They're just con head injuries that occur over a long period of time. So if we look at boxers, for example, they might go to the gym and, and spar even with headgear on and, and heavy gloves, but it's just that repetitive banging on the head that develops a condition which is now known as CTE. And this is a really, uh, it's got very important, serious consequences. Firstly, it, it's a condition that's very much in the spotlight at the moment. Uh, it, it's in a phase of learning a lot about it. So, uh, you know, 10 years ago, not too much was known about it. And now with all the, the publicity about concussion and head injuries and um, the, the, the consequences of head injuries, there's a lot of focus on C, CTE. And I think it's affecting, um, it's certainly affecting sports people the way they engage in the activity and, um, you know, in terms yeah. of, administrators who are now looking at rules. So we're in a phase where there's lots of change going on. Attention has been drawn to the consequences of head injuries. And I think now there's a reaction trying to firstly understand the medical associations, what are the consequences, and then secondly, trying to come up with ways of preventing them in the first place. You talk about changes and uh, how much all of this has come into uh, like fo focal, uh, focus of the public as well as administrators and rule makers. Uh, different sporting codes have got different protocols. We know what, uh, how it's dealt with in, in the world of rugby, for example. Uh, but having said that, in, in the world of football, professional football at the highest level, just last night, there was a match where two players uh, knocked each other, both trying to hit the ball, both knocked out, both ended up playing the rest of the match with bandages around their heads. But they really, they're not taken mm. off for any test, they didn't get knocked out, not taken off any test and carried on playing. Are we talking about change in that kind of uh, field as well? Most definitely. I think the sports in which the risk of head injuries is highest are the ones that are having a leadership role at this stage. So rugby has got very advanced strategies in place now to protect players and it's work in progress. And I think the sports where the risk of concussions are lower are kind of following along and, and slowly starting to realize the, the importance. It's not just the administrators that really need to be targeted, though. I know in rugby they've also counseled the commentators as well to refrain from trying to make out that a player is tough when he gets a head knock and then stands up and carries on playing. Mm -hmm. You know, often the commentators would have said, oh, so-and-so is tough as nails, a head knock's not going to keep him down. And you know the, uh, that sends out a message to the public that toughness is over, overrides any potential injury. So I think in addressing the problem, it needs to be at all levels. It needs to be at the medical level. It needs to be at the administrative level, where they look at rule changes to reduce the risk. It needs to be at the, at the commentator's level. It needs to be at the parent level. When children are involved, they need to understand mm -hmm. as well that if their child gets a knock on the head, 
it's not a case of toughness whether they continue or not. It's, it's, it has serious health consequences. So I think the more attention that's drawn to this condition, the faster public awareness will be uh, created. And then, you know, hopefully the, uh, the impression about getting a head knock and what, uh, you know, whether you're tough or not, whether you can carry on, yeah. you know, those um, misnomers will be dispelled. Professor, have, in South Africa, have any of the um, federations and associations reached out to, 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 uh, to you and, and uh, your team uh, to see if they can get more information in, as to how to dovetail your research and your findings to make sports safer for children in primary school, for, for professional athletes? Have any of them reached out to you yet? Yes, we work very closely with um, South African rugby. They have a program called BoxSmart, which is designed for rugby safety. And we've had a, a collaboration going on with them now since 2009. And they've done some amazing work making the game safer. And much of their uh, focus is on, on youth, because those are the, the population that are vulnerable. And uh, so their information is in the public domain. So people from, from different sports can go and look at what has been done in rugby. They just go to boxsmart, uh, www.boxsmart.com. There's an abundance of information, their guidelines for concussion, how to recognize a concussed player, what to do when a player get, gets concussed. So it's very practical information that's been designed for consumption by the public. Well, there you had it. Very interesting conversation there we had with, uh, I had with uh, uh, Dr. Mike Lambert about concussions and what happens uh, when athletes get knocked repeatedly uh, post their careers. Uh, definite information that you need uh, to adhere to and keep to mind. Now, Dolphins all-rounder Robbie Freilink has described his call-up to the Pro TS T20 team at the age of 33 a surprise. Freilink will count on all his experience in the upcoming T20 International Series against Bangladesh, starting at the Mangaung Oval in Bloemfontein, on Thursday. You get to a stage where you sort of say to yourself, right, well, maybe it's not meant to be and it's not going to happen. Um, it doesn't change what I've done over the last few years for my, for my franchise. Um, you know, I'm a type of player that when I get onto the field, I give 200%, regardless of what, what the outcome is going to be or what I'm looking to achieve. Um, I've always be a, been, a, been a good person on the field to fight hard um, and give it my all. So this is, yeah, did come as a surprise to me, but definitely um, I've been waiting for it for a long time and, and going to give it my best. Yeah, look, there's always, there's always different pressures. Each game's got its own pressures. Uh, this one I have a few more pressures, but, you know, I've, I'm, I'm at that age now where I'm not trying new things, I'm not doing anything new, yeah. so I, I pretty much well, touch wood and I, I think I know my game. Um, so for me, it's just to keep it as simple as possible, stick to my game plans that's, that's got me here and, and hopefully it goes well. I think it's pretty much the same as, as, as all formats. Um, you know, with, with this protest side, we've seen over the last few months that the batting lineup is, is phenomenal. So whether I get the chance to, to have a hit with the bat, we'll see. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a, quite a vital role. Um, I serve purpose with, with both, both formats, so batting and bowling. Um, I think I'll be used probably more with the bowling than with the batting. Um, but yeah, can do, can do the job with the bat if needed. I think growing up you, and, and playing as much cricket as, as we do, you respect every opponent. I mean, as soon as you, as soon as you take them for granted or you, you write them off, that's when they come back and sting you. So, you know, we definitely won't be, be writing them off, regardless of what's happened in, 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 the, in the test matches and the ODIs. Um, Bangladesh are a strong 2020 side. Um, they play all over the world in various competitions. So, yeah, I think it's a team to be respected. I think it's a cliche. You know, everyone will say, oh, you need to strike early, take wickets early. Um, not go for boundaries, but I think we know that this game is a boundaries game. Um, so, you know, I think it's just keeping it simple. You're hitting your areas that you want to be hitting, um, and that's all you can ask for. If they play good shots, they play good shots. If they play bad ones, we get wickets. So, yeah, 2020 for me is a very skillful game. Um, you have to be skillful. We, we, we've seen how good the batters are all over the world. So, you know, the skills need to be up top. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a lovely venue. Going back to to Bloom being the venue. Um, it played beautifully the last few weeks. So, yeah, I think we are, we're expecting a good wicket and a high-scoring game. Captain, 
uh, Faf du Plessis has been ruled out for up to six weeks due to that low back injury from the other day. Du Plessis sustained an acute lumbar disc yeah, injury during the third one-day one international one against Bangladesh and East London this past Sunday. He will require a period of rest and rehabilitation for the next six weeks, but hopefully will be fit for the test match against Zimbabwe starting on the 26th of December in Port Elizabeth. In the meantime, Supersport United was very well received upon arrival on, from Tunisia, where they beat Club Africain to reach the final of the CAF Confederation Cup tournament. They were 4-2 winners on an aggregate against the North Africans and will now be playing the uh, DRC's TP Mazembe over two legs. A defining moment for Supersport United, the first Continental Cup final, the Pretoria side is the fourth South African representative in a Continental Cup final in five years. United have followed in the footsteps of Orlando Pirates, who were Champions League finalists in 2013, and Confederations Cup runners up two years later. Mamelodi Sundowns won the Champions League in 2016. This isn't just about the semi final that, that we won uh, a couple of months ago. This is about Sudan. This is about. Um, this is about going to Guinea in our off-season, our so-called off-season, and, and fighting for a result there. It's about going to, to the DRC, coming back from 2-0 down after 10 minutes. This isn't just about, it's great that we, we went and put in a great performance the other night, but this has been a journey. It will be Eric Tinkler's third Continental Cup final as coach. However, he doesn't want to believe that his experience gives his side the edge. It's very, very different circumstances. Um, different club uh, playing against a very experienced team in, in TP Mazembe but we've beaten them before and uh, I have been there before as well and and you know what's what's important is obviously just for us to remain focused go there get the, the, the right result for most of the players reaching the final is a highlight of their careers it comes once in a lifetime, you know, as a footballer to make it to a, to a care final. So we're very happy, very proud of the guys. It's been a long journey, a tough journey, and we're very proud to be where we are now. It was very good to score the brace. I think, you know, after the first leg, you know, I think we missed a lot of chances, myself in particular. And, you know, I put myself in a lot of pressure to go there and score, score goals, you know, after laying the team down. Yeah, so I was very happy to get on the score sheet. The first leg of the final against TP Mazembe will be played during the third weekend of November in Lumbumbashi. The two sides drew twice during the group stages. United finished second in the group behind the DRC team. Leban Tube, SABC News, Kempton Park. Now, the Canon First Swing Golf Program for Disabled Schools took place at Rondebosch Golf Club in Cape Town on Tuesday. This national golf program is operational in 38 schools around the country at no cost to the children or their schools. It's more than just golf. It does help increase the children's self-esteem and confidence and improves the social and psychological development of disabled children. The Canon Future Swing Program provides specialized equipment, transport, a modified golf environment and qualified coaches who are trained to meet the special needs of disabled children. Currently, the program is focused in and around the big city centers. It's very important to be part and parcel of this, to actually help these kids develop. And it's all part of our, what we stand for, which is Koisei, which is living and working together for the common good. And teaching these kids more than just golf, it's life skills, it's giving them the opportunity to grow as individuals. Tournaments for deaf learners have been developed and an inter-school tournament has been introduced. The modified golf environment is created to expose disabled children to fun and acceptance. Golf is good and I want to play golf every day. I like it. It's nice, it's, it's sweet and nice, Tom, sports. It's very nice to play golf. I like it because it's my favorite sport and it's very nice. I teach a lot of stuff in there. I play here and I enjoy it and I like it. Monitoring and evaluation are done by 20 coaches countrywide and the program is operational at 38 schools. Well, at the end of the day, spending 17 years with all these kids all across South Africa, one of the biggest problems in our community is these kids need to be accepted 
throughout his social structure. So just getting him off the streets and give him the opportunity to be in a different environment, just to take these kids to a golf course is absolutely a fantastic experience for them. A wonderful initiative for disabled kids, an opportunity for them to practice golf skills, but the benefits are so much more and contribute positively to the children's physical, mental and spiritual well-being. Craig Murray, SABC News, Cape Town. And on that note, that's where we're going to leave it for the sports. Uh, we're pretty much done with the show, aren't we, Elvis? Yes, we're done with the show, but of course, we had a poll today, and of course, we wanted to your thoughts on it. There, it's on your screen right now. Uh, we asked the question, are the crime stats a true reflection of your experience? Now, 67% saying, no, not really, and uh, a third saying, yes, they are. This one from John Smith says, it's so easy to fabricate stats in words. The minister read the stats that he probably don't understand. Well, we and uh, Desi Lefella says, let's work together, police, community, we can win. And like you said earlier, that's what it's about. Everybody needs to work together to get it right. This one uh, from Jerry says, Minister Mbalula has to clean his house. His police of officers, officials, are corrupt. They're taking bribes, left, right and centre. Uh, that prompts that is only some sucking. Well, so says Jerry. Those are your thoughts. Thank you so much for participating in the programme on the newsroom. I'm Elvis Preslin. I'm Kendall Mahamad. Arrivederci. Ciao for now. Legamos.